Well, Charles, hello. It's great to be here again, Jason. Lovely to have you as always. We're closing in. It's Wednesday. It's time to close in. Yeah, finally, after so much, so much work. I mean, you and I have been at this for, this is, I think, our 70th video. Wow. And I mean, together uh, on this, of which I think 50 are in the long form format with slides and all that. And uh, I think it's finally beginning to pay dividends here. Well, and of course, you've been doing this for almost three years, right? Actually, more than three years, sad to say. <laughs> I think it's nice that we were able to come together, though, and create this kind of persistent uh, flow of information that kind of gave everyone a, a central area where they could find your information and review it and keep coming back to it and really get that concentration going. That built the momentum, I think. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think what, what we've been doing here, really, it's a, a marriage of sort of very old school ways of analyzing things. That would be my part of the contribution. And new school, availing ourselves of technology, that would be your part of the contribution. And what we're doing here, I mean, much as I really do like some of the personalities on Fox News and some of the content on Fox News, totally given up on globalist Bloomberg and <laughs> you know, NBC, perish the thought of even, you know, Maniac NBC and ABC and CBS. I mean, is I Maniac NBC MS? Right, <laughs> spelled with a silent S. Maniac. <laughs> well, I don't know what the S, right? The silent, it's a French right. silent S. But anyway, the, th the thing of it is, you know, when I, I watch Fox, you know, that they don't, what they should really do, if, and advice to the executives at Fox, I know that Rupert is basking in the glory of having been one of the few people down there in the Washington, D.C. with his new wife, Jerry Hall. Uh, but, you know, the thing of it is, people don't want to sit there. If you're 38, if you're the prime demographic, 25 to 54, you do not want to listen to Sean Hannity and be interrupted by adult diapers, <laughs> this medicine, you know, cars with kids, some other crazy, my pillow. You don't, you don't want to be interrupted every We like my pillow. We now. like my pillow, but still, you just, you, you want to have, a, particularly for something this big, yeah. this complicated, you want to get some big sponsors, of which there are many. Try some foundations. But I, I don't think we fully agree on this, because my problem with the sponsors isn't so much the interrupting of Sean Hannity's flow. It's that just any time you have that kind of corporate-owned, advertiser-driven news source, there's ways they control them. Yeah, but that's why I said foundations. You know, you got these husky foundations who are trying to spread the word, who are trying to like do good public service. Mm -hmm. Many of you, I, I don't particularly like PBS all that much, although I have to say I really enjoyed Downton Abbey, uh -huh. and I like Antique Roadshow and things like that. But um, the format of having these people who have got tons of money in a foundation, not for profit, just underwrite the cost of an hour long show and you'd be picky on it. You, you don't say you're gonna take it from the Clinton Foundation, you right. take it from you know, <laughs> a real foundation or the Obama Foundation. You take it from so, a foundation that's really trying to do good works and even better, if the foundation really wanted to be special, they would, they would say, you know what we wanna do here? We like what you're doing. We will, we're gonna underwrite this and we want you to say that you, this is underwritten by an anonymous donor. We will tell your legal people who it is but we, we, we don't want any credit, we, you know. But, but we do they want, also can't have any influence over well, but, the reporting. But foundations can't, hmm. right? You, you can't. Yeah, I like you that. Know, it's I like something that. like that um, actually could work a lot better. And, and rather than breaking up the flow, I mean, yes, I know that many people have a 15-second you know, attention span. Guess what? That's not our audience. Right? <laughs> Definitely <laughs> right? no. They could go stay in that, watch that YouTube channel with the pie and pieing you in the face and me in the face and go over there for seven minutes. You mean minutes. we're not going to have, in addition to Sunday with Charles and Charles Ortel closing <laughs> in, we won't have Charles Ortel in a bathtub full of fruit? <laughs> that I can very definitely <laughs> assure you. That would frighten whole bunches of no, people around the world. that would be the most popular show on uh, I don't the think truth. so. Well, until we can get that major foundation that is totally unbiased, I do like the model that I'm using here on Crowdsource yeah. the Truth, where the audience, the people, the crowdsource community, it's broken into sort of micro sponsorships so that no one is facing the financial burden of having to pay lots and lots of money, and everyone can be assured that there's no particular interest that's being unduly served, and it's been working pretty well. We've had some growth on Patreon, People can go to patreon.com slash crowdsource the truth and sponsor the program. We're coming up towards the end of the month, so now is the most important time 
for people to sponsor and we really do need the funds to keep things going we've got some travel planned in the future and even doing stuff like going to see dr corsi and doing those sure. types of interviews or car rental and things like that cost money so it's, it's great when people can become monthly sponsors or even do a one-time sponsorship at paypal.me sure. slash crowdsource the truth absolutely so once again that art department you know i mean they're just before every show they call me up and they say hey, compliment us we need a raise <laughs> but well, this one i mean this one I, it's very funny when i look at this i typically look at it first on my phone and all i got was the center thing and i'm like you know, jason who always talks about how the poster has to immediately grab the attention of like right. that's pretty damn subtle just the center of it <laughs> it's like what you know. but uh why don't, why don't you say, Jason, what, it, what is that? What's happening with that building? What is that? Well, this was a really interesting one, I thought, because, you know, you wanted to do Obamagate as a, as a sort of a play on Watergate, of course, because everything that's going on right now, I think we all agree, is like multiple factors worse than Watergate. And, of course, the famous movie Stargate that became the show SG-1. And I also thought it was a nice tie-in to some of the research that Quinn Michaels has done yeah. with the whole particle collider network, which by the inventor's own writing, Fermi, Enrico Fermi, he wanted to open a gateway to another dimension, which I, as I recall, is what that movie was about. So this was a nice, um, there's a lot of different treatments for the artwork from the original poster, but it's basically always a pyramid inside this Stargate. And of course, what we've shown here is the artist's rendering of the Barack Obama Presidential Library that will be built in Chicago, which this illustration doesn't actually even do it justice. It's quite pyramidal in its appearance with almost like the point chopped off so as to fool you. But we've also included, of course, former presidents, uh, B-Rock, Barry Obama, and Wild Bill Clinton there. Wild Bullock. Wild Bullock <laughs> Clinton. <laughs> and they're both sort of in their ethereal forms contemplating many, many years in jail, right. uh, hopefully. <laughs> well, so you know, here's the way, this is the reason I did not go to art school other than just totally sucking at it. I look at this and I, my crazy mind looks at, says Easter Island head. Right. You know, and then it's very interesting because that could be the Easter Island head, that view. But then it also looks like a side view of the Easter Island head. You know, that's the eye. That's it. very good, Charles. That's yeah. almost like a Rorschach. You know, my very favorite artist is Salvador Dali. Dali. Maybe I've told you that. But Dali's fascination was the manipulation of perception. Oh, yeah. So seeing all those different things is fascinating. And then, of course, we've got these hieroglyphics here, which I felt also tied in to Quinn's most recent research about the coded messages right. in letters from Richard Dawson's wife to their son that tie into the Zodiac murders. And we don't even need what? to get into the time phone hacking aspect of Again. it. Again. Right. <laughs> but it was a, an interesting um, little uh, piece of artwork that inspires so many things. And it will take you a million light years from home hopefully to a federal penitentiary. <laughs> right. Well, you know, just a few thoughts on the issue of Stargate and doors. Yes. Uh, you know, I'm the kind of person who, if I heard that you open that door, it might take you a million years, light years from home, nah. i keep that sucker closed, yeah. right? Because no. just the history, uh, the simple way to think about history is, you know, when a technologically advanced civilization meets a, c a civilization that may not be quite as advanced, the one that's not quite as advanced typically gets eaten. You know, yeah. and that would be us. Right. You know, you open that door, and it's like, hey, the food's ready, and everybody comes, you know, from a million light years away, and you know, starts eating us. So, so I, you're you're thinking if the exit portal for the Stargate is somewhere beyond like 72nd Street, you're not yeah, going. I'm not 72nd. <laughs> are you kidding me? Forget it. <laughs> I'm not going past the north exit of Grand Central except to go to the Rocket Club, which is fun. And the other thing I'd mention is, you know. We're going to be talking a lot about it here, uh, and I, I spent, I'm going to give a big shout out to you, Therese Lead, and, mm -hmm. who is uh, doing well. She's got some health issues, but uh, all the best to her. We had a, a really good show today uh, from 1 to 2 p.m., but when you think about the history, the bad blood between the Obamas and the Clintons, I don't know if you remember this history, but during the primary season, uh, and, and I, it was, yeah, was it during the primary season, or? It, yeah, during the, the heat of the primary season in 2008, Bill Clinton 
it was getting madder and madder that Teddy Kennedy would not support uh, Hillary Clinton. Hmm. And he, he thought that he'd seal the deal. He probably had like seven too many bourbons or whatever he drinks. <laughs> and he calls up Ted Kennedy and he, and he says, listen, you know, in so many words, he said, you gotta understand, you know, 10 years ago, this guy would have been bringing us coffee, referring to- Wasn't to, that Hillary who said that? No, no, it was Bill. Wow. To, to Ted Kennedy to try to get Kennedy, this, you know, the point was that Obama didn't really have any uh, uh. national political credentials to speak of. Right. Now, now, Hillary's national political credentials, I don't think we want to speak of, but, uh, you know, to say something like that. It's so racist. When you're, for, you know, it's just wrong to say something like that about anyone. But to think, you know, this guy, in theory, Bill, when he was president, you know, the economy was booming, he gets credit for that. He's not supposed to be stupid. To think that you could go to like, I mean, I guess, but I mean, to think that you would go uh, to Ted Kennedy, the, the lion spelled without an O of the, Senate, <laughs> of the Senate, and believe that you're gonna, I mean, because to say what you want about Ted Kennedy, uh, he, he really was passionate. Bad driver? Oh. <laughs> he was definitely a bad driver. <laughs> Wasn't so good with women either. But uh, he, he was truly passionate about trying to do stuff for minorities and African Americans, et, et cetera. To think that, you know, it was really going to be an unguarded moment where you say, hey, you know, I'm from the South. We talk like this. I mean, and, and to think that that kind of comment wouldn't get back to Barack Obama, which of course it did. Yeah. And that immediately, uh, Bill says that, immediately Ted Kennedy goes out and endorses Barack Obama, and Hillary goes down the loo, as they say in England. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So y y we have to look at this recent history, and we have to say, you know, with great cynicism, this is something that I was talking about with you, Therese, Americans and people around the world are uh, prone to suspend their natural disbelief about big problems, you know, it's, that's why magic works. You just, mm. you say, well, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna notice the obvious strings on that dollar bill that's floating up in the right. air, right? So with this mess, we have in the, in the Clintons, if they did nothing else right, what they did was pioneer the art of the war room. And that is basically, you know, getting a whole bunch of starry-eyed volunteers together to go through the dirt on the opposition and, understand what all the dirt might be on the opposition, see how to protect yourself to protect yourself from a dirt storm, mm. stay out of using the word. And, you know, so here's, here's people who, you know, were studying their opponents all the time that Bill was president of the United States. They, we know that they got some FBI files, we don't know how many they actually got, we don't know how much they went into the IRS, we don't know what Sandy Burglar, I mean, Berger was actually doing. Uh, but we definitely know that Bill Clinton and Hillary and the people around them were expert on the war room. Yeah. And we definitely know... And opposition research, they love that. Right, and so they, they certainly would have done work on Barack Obama, whether they did it when he was president or when they you know, pay, used the Clinton Foundation or the Clinton campaign to do it when it seemed like he was catching fire. Yeah. Uh, we know that they would have had their eye on this guy. Certainly by the time he was chastising you know, Ted Kennedy for supporting, for not making a decision, mm. right? So knowing that, we have to wonder what sort of dirt did the Clintons have on Barack Obama and what may they have held over his head? You know, we'll talk about this in a little more detail, but you think about, and this is what I was talking about with you, Therese, you think about um, how much of a battle it was for Barack Obama to come literally out of nowhere and to, to, to destroy the Clintons who were saying, Daniel Halper wrote about this in his book, Clinton Inc., it's a very good book, um, that it was the standard mode. What, he, what she did in, with her Senate race, I'm gonna be the nominee. You know, this was basically the way she went out to the other fundraisers. You know, other people were giving money to other candidates. Yeah. And you know what happens to people who cross me, right? Because I'm gonna be the Go nominee. Vince Foster. You know, you can't do that, I guess. <laughs> so, right? so you know what happens when I get cheesed off, right? So I'm gonna be the nominee, and then I'm gonna kick some Republican ass, and then I'm gonna be the president. And that's the kind of speech I believe more or less went out to the Democratic glitterati. Mm -hmm. And you know, notwithstanding all that, Barack Obama said, Neh. It's not nothing. gonna happen. I mean, you talk a Little Rock, Manhattan, I'm Chicago, you know, and, and he trounced her, crushed her. And, you know, so, but, so how do you explain having done that, because that actually happened, 
um, by June of 2008, yet by you know, January 20, 21st or whatever, you've got Hillary Clinton, the outward facing voice of the Obama administration to the whole world. You've got a memorandum of understanding, which means Jack Diddley is not enforceable. Bill Clinton's name is not on it. It does not you know, uh, guarantee that the relations between the Secretary of State. Well, no, no memorandum of understanding right. has any legal bearing ever. Right, but especially one that doesn't even have the name of the person <laughs> who might be doing all the corrupting. It's like the most worthless yeah. example of a worthless document you know, ever. That must have been negotiated by Doug Benn. But wait, it was. Oh. You know. <laughs> Is he a lawyer, Doug Benn? Uh, they say. I mean, he's, he must be good at something. He just bought David Rockefeller's house at a knockdown price, 20 million bucks. Wow. Down but, but he is a lawyer, huh? He, yeah, a member of the Florida Bar. Boy, I mean, that just goes to show you. Sometimes, that's like lawyers, doctors, and auto mechanics. You just don't know when you've got a bad one until it's too late. Well, as my father is always fond of saying, there's all, in any class, there's a bottom half. Right. And they, they, some of them do graduate. Now, here's a serious question. So a lot of people have always attributed the Barack Obama birth certificate controversy to Donald Trump or to Dr. Corsi or something like that. But isn't it true that Sidney Blumenthal was the first one to bring up the... My understanding is that, that Jerry Corsi was encouraged to go on this project by people close to the Clintons. That's my understanding. Now, you know, maybe we'll never... Because Dr. Corsi's been at the center of it for sure. But, I mean, in my view, all the evidence that they've presented, the document is a digital forgery. It doesn't tell us anything about where Barack Obama was actually born, or whether he's American or not American, but that birth certificate document on WhiteHouse.gov is a forgery. And you say that as an expert on I Photoshop. I am a digital imaging expert. I've been in this field for 31 years. I have a lot of technical knowledge, and I would, uh, you know, trade uh, info with the best of the best. Everything that Mike Zullo concluded, I independently came to those conclusions before I ever saw his investigation. Right, I think that's excellent stuff. And I, and I would say to the, the crowd, I mean, to remind the crowd, Jason's being modest. He's an award-winning 3D expert, lots of credentials. He knows his, his stuff here. But what I would say on this is actually so that we don't get attacked for going to open yeah. that box. What I would say is slightly different. You know, let's, let's put yourself in the mindset of the first African-American president of the United States who had Bill Clinton say, and whenever it was, April, May, June of 2008, what he said, who had you know, after a truce was negotiated in June of 2008, wakes up one day to see the New Yorker magazine cover of Michelle and Barack Obama dressed as terrorists inside the White House. Yeah. You know, that didn't happen by accident. Um, and, you're, and, you, and you finally beat, you know, lame brain John, lame, you know, muddled brain John McCain in the, in the uh, general election. And now you're gonna be the President of the United States. And guess what? The world is blowing up. I mean, it r literally is blowing up near total, you know, disaster around the world. So who are you going to pick on your team? Who do you want as your most trusted advisor? You've got all kinds of foreign policy crises. You pick Hillary Clinton to be your Secretary of State? That don't make no sense. You pick <laughs> Eric Holder, you know, uh, the person who, who let the Mark Rich pardon through as your Attorney General? Yeah. You know, you go down the list of the various people who were inserted in, you have this MOU that doesn't do anything to fix the Clinton Foundation conflicts. You know, you go down the list of these decisions, you let, you, you let the uh, Clinton machine operate with private servers and, un, you know, uh, devices that are not registered. You let uh, her use alias emails. It does not add up. Okay, you're the President of the United States, you're the leader of the free world. I don't like the fact that he won. I actually think he probably, as bad as he was, he's probably better than John McCain would have been. Yeah. You know, for different reasons, <laughs> which is saying something. Yeah. But, but, <laughs> but the fact, it just doesn't add up. And I know the mainstream press, you know, is in a major league suck up mode. Mm. But, you know, this is, this, for somebody who is sort of likes, enjoys a, a, amateur mystery solving, I mean, this is a mystery here. It does not explain. This is a proud person, Barack Obama. The way he behaved and strutted around, a very proud individual, you know, you would have thought he would say, listen, and the people around him would have said, yeah, I trust Hillary Clinton about as far as I'll, I'll throw the, whatever book she just wrote, which, <laughs> which you could throw that one pretty far because it's so light. But <laughs> it's thicker than Comey's. Yeah, right.
<laughs> we got to measure it in British thermal units or something else. I, I mean, not to digress, and I know I do all the time, but I really feel like all these book writing deals, it's just like that's the known, like, open cover to here's your $10 million advance, Mr. Comey, just write a bunch of nonsense, or we've got a bunch of people who can pound out a 200-page book in a weekend, and we'll put that out and put you in Barnes & Noble, have Laura Loomer yell at you and run you out the back door. Well, that's, but see, that's, that's why I say, and we, is you're not going off to, uh, off to enter here, I mean, the, if we're gonna bring regulations into the 21st century, catching up or trying to anticipate even the yeah. flow of technology, it seems a simple principle is, you must be. You must disclose not this baloney financial statements that the politicians dis disclose, but a rigorous, you know, toughly independently audited financial statement with any changes happening during the year included. And you you must. There cannot be these sweetheart deals where you say, you know, to somebody like Hillary Clinton, okay, you're such a lousy speaker <laughs> and you're such a lousy writer that we're going to give you a ten million dollar advance so you can pay two hundred thousand dollars to some idiot to write the book and say that you wrote it, you know, and then go around in the Scooby-Doo mobile, you know, <laughs> right before the speech, and then you'll, we'll give you another $200,000 speech <laughs> to say utter gibberish, you know, to, to your adoring group of fans. I mean, that's just not something that should be allowed. You shouldn't be allowed to have this fake firm on the side Taneo, uh -huh. where, you know, Doug Ban gets to charge Coca-Cola a million dollars a month for doing sweet F all. Well, maybe he's got Chris Gowan, uh bringing the Diet Cokes to Bill Clinton. You know, Charles, Hillary Clinton has a speaking engagement coming up. This is bizarre to me. It's in the Spark Arena, which is a gigantic, like, Eric Clapton style, you know, uh, maybe Maroon 5 would go there, but Spark Arena in, like, New Zealand or something, she's gonna be speaking there. What, why, why would people want to see Hillary Clinton? I can't start? imagine anybody who would be dumb enough to want to go all the way to New Zealand. To, I mean, there's nobody I know who would even think about doing that. But the people who are in New Zealand are apparently going to fill this gigantic place to go see Hillary Clinton yammer on about whose fault it was that she lost the election. I wonder who she'll blame it on. But I mean, it looks like a gigantic place. You could have the superb owl in there. Well, I think, you know, the, the thing of it is, and I understand actually New Zealand is a wonderful place that, that, that if you like nature and you like, you know, nothing around you and lots of sheep and, you know. Kim.com. Kim.com. And I don't, maybe they have some good, they have lamb, pretty good lamb and butter. You know, so you can have butter lamb sandwiches. And Harmon Wilfred is there. He's he there. He could go see Hillary Clinton at Spark Arena. They'll shoot him the second he gets there. <laughs> That's right. I but, hope not. Yeah, but uh, you're sitting there, I mean, it's, it, it's May, you know, you're, and actually the other thing is I believe that time of year, not that it's freezing, but I think it's, that's their winter. Oh, yeah, right, the beginning, side of the... Yeah, I may have that wrong, but I, I, I don't know how the currents work and if there's a, the equivalent mm -hmm. of a Gulf Stream over there, but... but um, the yeah. final thing I want to bring up before we get to the slides, sure. just this whole concept of opposition research, like that sounds like you're actually like legitimately researching and uncovering facts that just happen to be about the opposition. But it seems in practice to be much more the invention of nonsense that hurts the opposition. Right. And the manipulation of it. I mean, I think, you know, on the subject we've talked about, you know, YouTube channel striking and right. when you think about the, the apertures that are controlled by sympathizers of globalists and corruption, right. you know, it's YouTube, it's Twitter, Twitter it's right. Facebook, and then it's the editorial rooms, you know, of the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal and, you know, limited number and the, a few of the top shows that nobody yeah. watches any of the Sunday shows anymore. But, you know, except for Sunday with Charles. That's right. They're all that's swarming. why they hate us for real, because if you're not on board with their program, whatever, you know, however they get you to do it, they want you to shut up. Well, I mean, that's why we scheduled it at 3 p.m. out of deference to the people who want to go out. I, from when I was younger, you know, and had a reason to carouse, Saturday was my night. Right. Friday, I was always tired. I'd go to sleep early. But Saturday, man, I'd be up till 2, 3, 4 in the morning. So oh. you want to be able to sleep, sleep through the Sunday shows, you know, have a brunch. 
Yep. You know, get the Bloody Mary pitcher out there <laughs> and, you know, live tweet Sunday with Charles starting there at 3 go. p.m. You You're go. golden, unless you Perfect. live in the West Coast. Yeah, but, oh, well, then, you know, Joe Napoli is watching it at noon before he hits the links. There you go. Yeah. There you go. So um, we actually covered some of this. I might have known that this slide was coming. But what we try to do here, ladies and gentlemen, um, is we try to lay out so you can go back and look, just look at the first page, what it is we're actually going to be talking about through the balance of these slides. This one, I have to say, Jason and I have both been extremely busy, and today I was uh, only able to put this together. I only devoted two hours to this. Whoa. And so uh, that was all I could do. But I, I believe I might know the subject a little bit, so it was easier for me to, I wasn't starting from a standing start. Hmm. My point here is, and it's a point we've been drilling home a long time ago. In fact, I even did, when I was writing for the Washington Times, I did a piece when I believe it was, I forget when it was, where I said that, I think it might have been in, I'll have to, I'll have to check, it was early on. It might have been as far back as even in 2012, where I said that uh, what was going on vis-a-vis -vis Benghazi mm. was worse than Watergate. Yeah. You know, and, and if you think about what really likely happened under Obama. We had the apparatus of uh, the CIA or the, you know, the, the intelligence services, the FBI and the intelligence services, I believe they were weaponized against perceived opponents of the regime. They certainly went after James Rosen, their allegations they spied on the Senate and the House and the Supreme Court, and certainly a whole raft of journalists. Hmm. And that is something that, you know, unless we get hit, God forbid, by an EMP, the, uh, or something like it, technology is going to get more and more powerful and intrusive. People are stupidly going to let those Alexa things into their house and remember what comes next. And next thing you know, it'll be, you come home and it's, it'll be like, you know, a, a bad ex-girlfriend. There's like, A, there's no building. And even if there were a building, there are no clothes. There's no, nothing of your stuff is there because the Alexa robots just go, hey, he's asleep. Whoosh. Yeah. <laughs> Roll up the moving truck, you know. So, well, but it's an interesting point because we really, as regular people, just like as a computer user, you've told me this story about how you bought your first laptop and tried to install the software by like, I, oh, yeah, I, I deserve that. I'll tell the story. But, but I'm just saying like, it's difficult for the average person to anticipate what the applications would become. I mean, the phone, the iPhone or the Android phone, it's essentially the same thing. Central processing unit, screen, memory, storage, processing, applications, it's the same thing. But for an average user to have looked at that computer in 1982 or three and said, oh, well, someday this will be a ubiquitous device that everybody carries, it is difficult to anticipate. And this Alexa is sort of everybody's, and Siri and all these things, it's your introduction to AI and the mining of all of your data and activities and the listening to everything you do. That's not going to happen in my It's house. happening. Well, not, maybe not in not, your house. Not my You house. got the phone. You got the TV. Yeah. They're listening. I know. That's going to be changing soon. But anyway. <laughs> yeah. So um, what we're going to be talking today about is the fact that, that you know, once the blinders finally come off, and it's going to be difficult to rip them off fake yapper's eyes, <laughs> and, uh, you know, the folks down at, uh, forget about the folks at CNN, Jeff Zucker, and those people, they're just going to have to find another line of work. Uh, but once the blinders finally do come off, and I think they're coming off the American population at large, mm -hmm. uh, people are going to wake up and say, you know what, we have been sold a gigantic turd of goods, not bill of goods, <laughs> turd of goods. Bill of turds. Right. <laughs> and, you know, in the case of Watergate, I remember Watergate, uh, I had my first serious summer job working of all places, Simpson Thatcher, yeah. and you know, uh, it was the summer of 74. And Doug I, was impressed by that. <laughs> that I worked? Or that no, I also, the, the Watergate aspect. Right. And so I, re I remember thinking this was amazing, and the revelations truly were amazing. And um, this is nothing. I think Chuck Colson, you know, who, who, who meddled, I think he was the one who meddled with IRS records, went to prison for four years or something for doing that. Here we may have had a situation where the Obama Justice Department and Eric Holder and the IRS got together and in advance of the 2010 midterm election said, we can't let anything like the Tea Party happen mm. and decided to you know, really go hard against people with money who might be supporting the Tea Party and then the Tea Party itself. I mean, that, for that alone, a lot of people, Lois Lerner, if you're listening, don't even think about going to Brazil because we're going to get you. 
one way or another. You, you're going to do jail time, I think. And the people around Lois Lerner should do jail time. And Eric Holder, you know, you may be thinking about running for president. Forget it. Check the time phone hack Obamagate Stargate device, because the only place you're going to be doing that <laughs> is one million years, light years from now. You're not doing it in the United States of America, I don't think. I like it that you put Lois Lerner on, uh, on blast there. She has done a lot of incredible things. And she didn't do that by accident. I mean, right. the whole bunch of, uh, of people. I think what happened is, uh, I remember R Rahm Emanuel was quoted as saying under Clinton, uh, uh, you know, executive orders are pretty cool, man. Stroke of a pen, change the law. You know, and I, I, I imagine there are a bunch of people who like, the same people who said, you know what, now that you're President Barack, why don't we check out the Statue of Liberty in Air Force One? Remember when that happened? <laughs> you know, the, the Air Force One buzzed around that. I don't remember. Yeah, right after he got elected. I remember. I mean, and it was a, no one's ever explained exactly who was on that jet and why they were flying so low over Manhattan. You know, that's not something we like here in Manhattan no. after 9 11. No. And I think they may have regarded it as just sort of like a plaything. We do what we want, the rules don't apply to us, no one's ever going to check. We got this done. Yeah. You know, and they shot the moon. They, they figured they, you know, break all the rules. Right. And that, you know, they anoint their successor hmm. and nobody would ever know. You know got that yeah. one wrong. Yeah, that's, that's the way it's gone for so long. I think they were just overly confident in the ability to do that. Right. So if we go to the next page, and we'll try to, we're going to keep this under two hours, I promise. This is the uh, standard disclaimer. And... Uh, I, what we've done here, this is a, a bit of a special presentation. Um, I thought that it might be use, useful to put out some of the ways in which, before I mentioned Jason, we were attacking, trying to spread the word in alternative media. There mm. were some people who were very helpful. Eutrice Lead and Gary Nall on Progressive Radio Network were very helpful. John Batchelor on WABC Radio was very helpful. We, um, sorry to interrupt, but we should give Utrice a shout out. Like, how do people find Utrice stories in there? Well, you it's have. Is out. it just in? Well, we do have that. We could go right to that now if you want, sure. because I don't know if you're aware of this, Charles, but you were on Lead Stories. No, that wasn't me. It wasn't you. Oh, <laughs> that's why we played that song all the time. But so, I'm trying to pretend I'm Hillary Clinton. That wasn't me. So if you go to leadstories.podbean.com, you can follow Utrice Lead, and then she's got a link here to the Progressive Radio Network where you're frequently appearing with her. And certainly uh, our best wishes go out to Utrice for her to get well and overcome uh, whatever health issues she's dealing with right now. Yeah, but the thing about Utrice that I really have enjoyed, and I, I don't know how many different times I've been on her show, I just, uh, it's a lot is that we go all over the place, different places. Uh, she likes to have these uh, Friday sessions, Speak Your Mind, Free Your Mind Friday, mm -hmm. where people call in. And mm -hmm. those are actually a real treat. We did a bunch of those. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, you know, it's a progressive audience. And I, you know, I wouldn't say even with all the exposure that I've had on that uh, channel, I wouldn't think of myself you know, as a progressive per se. Yeah. Yeah, not so much. <laughs> but you know, but you, there's commonalities, right? With right. anti-war and responsible right. spending and that kind of thing. Anti-corruption. Yeah. And and you know, those who try to divide us are doing that so that they can get you to buy stupid bu stupid bumper stickers and go to the ten thousand dollar or hundred dollar whatever it is. Go to the stupid speech and Spark mm -hmm. Center in New Zealand, yeah. so you could buy one of these stupid books. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it suits. That, that, you know, the establishment to have an artificial divide right. when they're really on, on, certainly on the issues of the deep state, on charity fraud, on reforming academia, on, on not wasting money either on foreign aid or on, you know, education inside this country and the, in the uh, poor communities, whether they be urban or rural. You know, th there's a lot of common interests, but there's also great uh, financial motivation to have this artificial divide and let you know Congress, s you know, s s throw money around half a billion a month. Wow, is, is basically we spend six trillion dollars a year all in on government. That's half a billion a month. It's good work if you can get it, Charles. I'm telling you. But uh, so what we try to do here is we're trying to use uh, the tools that are available in a different way to reach out to the, you, the people, the audience. We love your comments. I'm getting a lot of comments now. They're very helpful. Forgive me if I can't respond to all of them, 
but I really appreci appreciate getting them, even critical ones. And uh, you can do that through my um, was it way to contact me through my website. Uh, the playlist, Jason, is probably worth pulling up. Sure. Um, the playlist has actually become even more important now, Charles, because after all of these malicious anonymous strikes on the original Crowdsource the Truth channel, we've, we've bounced around. Of course, the original Crowdsource the Truth channel was my old YouTube channel, and then we had to use the YouTube channel from my 3D production company, and now we're on to Crowdsource the Truth too. So it's been a little confusing for our regular viewers to find the broadcasts all the time, but if people just search for Crowdsource uh, for Sunday with Charles, they will come to this handy dandy playlist, and we're on the 70th show we've done. Yeah, and I, you know, I think you should probably subcategorize them. You know, and this would be the Fright Night one, <laughs> the Fright Night collection, the Halloween. Yeah, that's going to scare children under the age of 60. Right. <laughs> the image, yes, it's haunting. Uh, and I don't know, they were, they were trying to, I didn't even put this link in, but I, and you may not have seen it today, but apparently in Amy Chozik's book, which mm -hmm. is actually, could be kind of interesting, uh, they, they're trying to sell the softer side of Hillary Clinton, claiming that she loves to, to flirt, there's a flirty side to Hillary Clinton, oh, boy. and she especially, especially likes to flirt with straight men. And I put uh, that in the category of comedy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> horror. That's, that's not happening, that never happened. Now, what is this book? It's Chasing Hillary, 10 Years, Two Presidential Campaigns, One Intact Glass Ceiling. Is that the name <laughs> of it? That's the book. That happened. Wow. It was released uh, yesterday. Oh, but this doesn't remotely sound like a positive Hillary Clinton book. Well, Amy Chozik uh, was, I forget, I think she was at the Wall Street Journal, and then she went to the New York Times, and she was actually somebody with Nick Confessor who wrote that story. Uh, unease at the Clinton Foundation over finances and something or other that I saw in August of 2013. What's it called? On Your Knees at the Clinton <laughs> Foundation? <laughs> that's a different book. Yeah, that's a different book. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Charles. Yeah, that's the intern, that's the Clinton intern program. But uh, anyway, if we get back into the rhythm here a little bit. Um, Sorry. It's okay, and go back to the slide page. Right. Uh, we have this disclaimer out there for a reason. Those of you who are watching around the world that don't have the protection of the First Amendment, we still do. And what we try to say on the show, to, other than when we're joking around, is all based on hard analysis and we try to provide as much as possible the links so that you, the viewers, can go and do the kind of work that it's important to do to make informed judgments. You know, we can all shoot from the hip that's you know how the students get away with pretending that they were actually educated at most universities because they <laughs> listen to the professors who don't know what they're talking about. Um, but here, what we try to do, and what I think it's so important to do to separate fact from fiction, is to first understand the difference between fact and fiction. Yeah. And then once you do, go and follow these uh, leads that we provide for you. And not everything's perfect, but we give you a sense of where we're the where we're. Um, finding the undergirding for our arguments. And you can see, that, see it for yourself. And maybe you'll see a mistake. If so, we'd love to hear about it. Yeah, and real quickly, Agent 99, one of our avid followers who's always watching, she's asking if the gentleman who spoke with you outside of the James Comey book event, who was both a CPA and an attorney, has he contacted you? Ixnay on that one, and he never yeah. will. Yeah, I, I mean, that, the funny thing, and it, it's gonna sound like I'm bragging, and I'm not bragging, I'm just explaining the way I was trained. When I got into business at 24 years old, you know, went into work for this investment bank, Dylan Reed, that doesn't exist anymore, we had a long roster of very big clients, and I got the opportunity over the course of 11 years to fly around the world and work on projects with CEOs and their top people, hiring the best experts. The way it typically worked is, the bankers then had the upper hand. We would hire the law firms. The ma typically on big deals, the managing partner of a law firm would work for me when I was maybe a vice president. And even that guy was an idiot. No, 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 <laughs> no, no, those are very smart people. But they would, if you're, I'm leading a deal as, as a vice president, senior vice president, manager, whatever, it's, tip it's a big deal. The managing partner and very, very senior par partners are actually working for you. Right. And the accountants were basically way down the track. We didn't really like most of what, what they were doing. We would bring them in occasionally. We were, they're not that impressive. For this guy to lead with, you know, 
I'm an accountant and an attorney, but I know nothing about charity fraud, and that's why I have such strong opinions. About you know, he, that caught my attention. Plus, I don't, I'm not a hugger, as you know, and I really don't like perfect strangers coming up to me and touching me. He, he was, was getting in your, yeah, in your space. He was trying to get sure. in my grill. I think he was an employee of BKD, possibly. I don't, I, yeah, I think he was bounced out of BKD. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, so if we jump right into it, um, we have here this, and I want to go through not every one of these. We'll talk about them. We won't pull them all up. But the first one I want to pull up, because, you know, this is, uh, here I'm saying that uh, the mainstream press, you know, anything they can find out about Trump they want to see. But when it comes to Obama, it's like, transcripts? I don't need those. We don't need no stinking transcripts. You know, I, I don't, I, you know, Benghazi? Why would anybody care what was happening at Benghazi? I mean, it was a cartoon. Everybody knows it was a cartoon. I mean, on the other hand, here we have the Associated Press demanding access to the records that Mueller just seized. I think this includes Michael Cohen's records and all these other What right does the Associated Press have to see the records of a special prosecutor? Uh, you know, that's not the way it works. You have, you know, you sh there shouldn't be a special counsel or whatever, and now uh, a grand jury proceeding if there is one, and the press looking at this stuff that may or may not, before it goes to a grand jury, go to the grand jury. It's got to be sealed, doesn't it? I mean, you, yeah, you can't do this. And the, here's the AP falling over itself saying, oh, we abs, because there's no collusion. You know, we, we know there's no collusion. That story fell flat on its face. You know, we've been at this now since for two years or so. We had eight years of saying, you know, Barack Obama would sit there and, you know, drop something in the turbo, in, you know, in the, in, the, in the punch bowl that doesn't <laughs> smell too good, and the press would go, that's fantastic, you know? <laughs> and here we have, you know, the AP saying, we absolutely have to go there. And, and this is, you know, this is a major league story at 2 o'clock this afternoon. Huh. Getting a lot of, a lot of uh, coverage in the press. It's absurd. This guy, I think, you know, this guy needs to be investigated, in fact. Mm. Yeah. So, so we go back into the slides. Um, now, uh, on the second one here, I want to... Uh, I'm going to clue the audience in and you into. There's a very highly sophisticated methodology of analysis that I learned at Harvard Business School and perfected in investment banking, right? And it's the, um, I mean, I just want to get this right. Um, but we could pull up the, the link, the National Review link. Now, you know, and, and, and you look here, and it's it, the question of, you know, did Hillary, did, did people vote for Donald Trump? Because, yeah, I know what it is. It's, it's a very famous analysis. Many PhDs have been gotten, it's the, 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 the famous stole suck analysis, right? <laughs> did Donald, did the Russians steal the election? Or did Hillary Clinton just suck as a candidate? Yeah. You know, and that's, that's the basic question for the ages in 2016. No, Donald Trump didn't steal the election. And yes, Hillary Clinton sucked as a candidate. Charles, and, this is a wonderful example of a picture speaking a thousand words. Yeah. All the press around her, the sour face, right. stronger together. And she's at the center of this. And she's like, she's sitting there, I mean, I really don't want to have to be doing this. I mean, why do we have to have a campaign anyway? I'm 50 points ahead in my right. head. You know, I mean, why am I on this plane? It's, you know, we don't have to campaign. Everyone stay home and I'll just, you know, show up on January 20th at noon. Uh, you know? So uh, if we go into the, the actual, yeah. And then what happened here, this is really a, a big thing. Kanye West, the Federalist, um, you know, I, I have to say, I'll just, you know, I get in trouble saying what I think, but that's, that's the way I roll. You yeah. know, I think his music sucks. I mean, yeah. I, and I, I'm not an expert on music, although my, I was, my mother was an expert on a very different kind of music, Johann Sebastian Bach. He may be a great entertainer. His music stinks, in my opinion. <laughs> but, you know, for this guy to come out and say what he said, backing Candace Owens, who I think is, is absolutely correct, Candace says that famously, that African Americans and other minorities shouldn't see themselves as victims, but as potential victors. And I know that's, you know, rhyming sort of whatever, but it's true. You know, people will tell you, and you know, the sport, it's obviously not, you know, everyone doesn't play this sport, but 
in, in tennis, people will tell you when I was playing as a youngster that at a certain, it doesn't take hard to get to the level where you could actually win a big tournament. What separates people you know, who are talented uh, from others who become winners is a winning attitude. The idea that you go in and you're going to win. When you start thinking of yourself as a winner, you will eventually win if you have talent. You know, me thinking of myself as a winner, as an artist, that ain't going to happen. But if you pick, you know, if I pick something that has to do with numbers or something like that and I decide I'm going to win at it, I will win. And so to take a generation of minority kids, you know, men out of several generations, and to encourage them to think of themselves as always as victims, as deserving of handouts, right. and this Super comes, predators, as Hillary called yeah, them. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you can't do that. And for Kanye West to stand up, it's, it's so wonderful he's standing up and, and doubling down now. He was yeah. harshly criticized for defending Candace Owens. He's Candace Owens, and he's, he's doubling down now. And I think he is, on this one, he's absolutely right. You know, maybe his other flaws, but on this point, it's so right. You take, I remember, uh, you know, in a different moment, I remember going, my first day at a, you know, this elitist school, Horace Mann, well, I was, however old I, year, years old I was, I was 12 years old or something like that. We go in the first meeting of, of, of classes and it is, uh, you know, all school, no, I think it was just the seventh grade assembly. And before us, we, we had some writer, I forget which one it was, who was a graduate of the school, who was honored. And then the headmaster got up and he gave us a speech about you are special people, you're gonna go out, you're gonna do great things, we're gonna invest in your mind and your training and this and that, you should think of school as a treasure and a privilege. You know, we're there for you. Now, little did I know what was really going on at Horace Mann when I was there. Then, what was? Remember the whole teachers were going after some of the students. But, I didn't know about that. No, that's all over the New York Times. But, but when that, was that? 68 to 74. Oh, I wasn't even alive. Yeah, well, that's why I forgive you. <laughs> How could you have known? Yeah. You weren't even, a, you probably weren't even a concept yeah. at that point. But anyway, yeah. um, you know, but you take young children, you don't want to do that. You don't want to take somebody who has no prayer of being a basketball star and saying, you know, you're going to be the center for the Knicks when right. you're 5 2. I mean, that, that's not going to happen. But, yeah. you know, <laughs> you, you get, everyone's got some talents. Right. And, and you, you can say to somebody, look, you know, find what you think w will help you figure out what you're going to be talented in, and then think of yourself as a winner pursuing this talent. It shouldn't yeah. be serial killing. It should be, you know, something that's productive. But, right. you know, and, and Kanye West and the people who are you know, beginning to open their eyes and speak up deserve enormous credit. This could actually be a turning point out on the West Coast, here in New York and Chicago and these other places, these elitists. We have these idiots walking around with their scruffy beers and their woolen hats and looking at their cell phones with their earbuds in. You're talking about being social justice warriors with $200,000 of student loans and you're grumbling that they can't get ahead in life. Yeah, shave your beard, get rid of the hat, figure out what you're good at, forget about, you know. What are their goals, Charles? Yeah, what are their loans? <laughs> anyway, but this is, I actually think in, the, in history, if this plays out the way it could play out, uh, this is a big moment here, a big, because as Candace said a couple nights ago on Hannity, she said, you, people need to understand that if the black vote goes 5% more to Trump, the Democratic Party is finished. Hmm. Because the Democratic Party has been taking the black vote and the minority vote for granted. I'll tell you what, Charles, I've spoken to quite a few black people who are pro-Donald Trump, and right. they're reluctant to discuss it among their black friends because they just get immediately slammed. And there's even people who I've interviewed on the streets of New York, black people, who when they, one guy was wearing a uh, Make America Great hat and all of these other minorities, black and other races, started yelling at the guy for liking Trump. And I was like, you guys are being racist. He doesn't have to dislike Trump because he's black. Well, I'll give it, maybe we'll even figure out how to do this ourselves with, uh, with uh you know, Don Nguyen, who could do the music. But um, I was in, I used to go to this McDonald's on uh, 14th Street, and I think I, I told you the story, I was sitting there and minding my own business, and I sensed this big presence. And I, I kind of look up, and there's a towering African-American guy with a security hat on. I'd seen him in there before. And he looks at me, you voting for Trump? <laughs> and I, the oh, McDonald's but, security. No, he was just—he was just—he was just—he was a oh. patron who happened oh, to work oh. nearby. And I'm thinking, wow, this is going to be a rough question to answer. <laughs> what do I do? And I—I I, I didn't vote. People know that I did not vote in 2016. 
because I was so involved in trying to expose the Clinton Foundation fraud, I didn't want people to be able to say, you know, he's got a point of view, he's a, a partisan, ah. I did not vote. Oh. But at that time, uh, you know, I said, y y yes. <laughs> and he's like, right on! <laughs> wow. Fist pump, and he goes, you know, we used to have an expression where I live, you know, Trump was the man, you know, people would like to say, I'm trumping it, I'm living large. Right. I, I you mean, know? So for Kanye, we could do some lyrics, you know, stop chumping it, I'm trumping it. <laughs> you know, that's the kind of stuff, right? We get something going along those lines. Trump ones. was actually in a bunch of different hip hop songs, was like before he ran for president. People thought he was great. I mean, there were, Dennis Rodman is friends with Trump. He was on The, uh, the Apprentice and everything. I still say they should make Dennis Rodman the ambassador to North Korea. Yeah, well. We could always disagree about it. Disagree about it. He's things. friends with Kim. Right. I mean, well, why not? the one thing I would say about Trump, which is, you know, he's he's certainly comfortable in his own skin. Yep. And um, even when he's doing weird stuff like brushing dandruff uh, off uh, yeah, Macron. Yeah. yeah so, well, they had they had an expression at this snooty firm I work for that you, you know you're a top banker when you can in, in a meeting in front of other people tell the CEO that his fly is open. Yeah, and and th th there is an element of that that if you're you know you have a strong relationship with somebody if you can do that, yeah. but I think there might have been a few people watching that that yeah. episode. So. <laughs> but you know the thing that's happened, and Hillary and even Obama are going to find out just how fickle the public is. They ain't cool no more. Hmm. You know they're just not cool. Mm -hmm. And they're the MySpace. Of, they're exactly, uh, <laughs> they're the MySpace. If you look at this CNBC hit, like here. Um, Here's this, this Clinton fundraiser lady, and they're covering it on CNBC, of all things, right? Mm. After the, there's a, this viral video of, of this fundraiser losing it. Um, I guess oh. you've got to keep the ad blocker on or something. Sorry. Well, you know, because otherwise we get hit with a million ads all the time. Well, you let the, people can watch it for themselves if they... We, we got it here. We okay. got a, another way to do everything. All right. But, yeah, thank you. I mean, we don't have to pull this up unless we can hear the sound. Yep. We can? Okay. Oh, well, the audience will. All right. But it's, it's supposedly damn funny. Not good for this lady who had to resign. But this is typical of the attitude of, uh, of the people around the Clintons. They just think they're way above the law. And that's why this, you know, that's why, look at her, look at her body language. She's talking to a bunch of cops having been pulled over. Right? Her daughter was in the car. And look at her attitude. I'm a conservative citizen, friend of the mayor, I've been in Tenafly for 20 years. And the guys are like, eh, yeah, yeah. They should have treated her like they treat everybody else, like throw her down, knee to her back. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, put her in the drunk tank. It didn't really play yeah. her audio too much. But. All right, well, it's, but the point here is that this, this is the way, you know, people in the, the, the Republican side act as well like this. You know, they get very full of themselves. But that's not the concept. That's not the concept of uh, American governance that, you know, these, everybody in American government works for we the people, and they need to remember that. Mm. And I think that Donald Trump, uh, and his, you know, Donald Trump certainly has a global-sized ego, but, you know, much of what he's doing, he's working, in theory, for free. Um, we could debate that. Did he donate the money or something? Oh, he is. He's, he's donating all his salary to charity, and people will quibble and maybe not write. the Clinton Foundation. I hope. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> yeah, that that ain't happening. Because he could get himself into some tax trouble if yeah. he does that. But then, then Rachel Maddow would have an episode. <laughs> that would be pretty funny. I hope she gave the Clinton Foundation. I know Stephanopoulos did, or as somebody calls. Can him, we get his tax return from the New York Times? I doubt it. But as, <laughs> as somebody called him, Clintonopoulos. But uh, Clintonopoulos. But I don't know if you can pull up New York Times. Yep. Yeah. So I only watched because I was quite busy uh, a little bit of this. But just let's stay on this picture for a second, okay? Remember the whole thing about all these after Donald Trump won, designer after designer said, oh, I'm not going to dress Melania Trump. I never do that. Hmm. You know, wow, yeah. how did she manage to find clothes for that state dinner? I mean, it's just, and this picture does not do justice to the gown that she wore, not, the, um, not even remotely a fashion expert. Hmm. But this is, it was just a stunning, uh, you know, gown. And beyond that, the pictures that I saw of the event itself, it's worth noting, I believe, that uh, 
Uh, Michelle Obama expanded her staff to be 30 people or so. She cut her staff down to 10. Michelle used outside consultants. She did not for this dinner. Hmm. They had this, would have these gigantic state dinners where you, know, you felt like you were in a crowd. This was very small and intimate. Um, and I think, you know, let's stop with a nonstop 24-7 hate Trump mania and let's start appreciating how special it is. Here's Melania Trump was not born in this country. She made it on her own before she made the decision to marry Donald Trump. Yeah. She has been conducting herself with style and grace. Yeah. She, for example, to the Bush uh, funeral, I thought, not that I'm a huge fan of those people, but I thought it was very touching that she arranged for people who had served in the Bush White House, H.W. White House and the W. White House, to fly down and, as her guest, flying mm -hmm. with her to that funeral. Mm -hmm. She's very thoughtful, yeah, and she's not out there, you know, trying to rip everybody a new one who doesn't believe in whatever she believes in. She is, didn't grow up in this country. Very well educated. A lot but of people speak, might not know. Speaks speaks five languages, and half the American electorate can't speak English. Right. You know, I mean, and, and looks yet looks down her nose, their noses at this Melania. So, I mean, come on, people. Let's. This, this guy's been in office. She's been with him. Uh, the economy is moving in the right direction. Get off your high horses, shave your beards, throw off those ridiculous hats of both varieties. The I won't pink, say the other one, the pink, the pink and the hats. other colors. Yeah. You know, and, and try to do something productive. If you really care about helping people, why don't you start by helping people in the inner cities in this country? Yeah, she seems a very decent woman. And it's kind of sad that people want to project their own morality on someone. Like if when she was in her modeling career, she chose to be in a bikini or naked or whatever. If someone objects to that, I mean, does that make her a horrible person versus someone who's always showing up in a Chairman Mao oven mitt pantsuit, but yet doing all these crooked deals that cost people their lives? I think I'd prefer a Playboy model in... She's uh, never a Playboy model. Well, uh, sorry, yeah, yeah. A, 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 a model who may choose to appear right. in a state of undress that someone might morally object to, but isn't a vile criminal who is cheating and lying and stealing money of vast sums. Well, let's put it slightly differently. I mean, if this, the first state dinner of Hillary Clinton would probably be with, you know, I don't know if Robert Mugabe's still alive in Zimbabwe, <laughs> but it would probably be him. And, the, and instead of Melania as first lady, you'd have Bill Clinton, you know, as first laddie, if, right. you, could, if you could find him during hitting the dinner. Hitting on the waitresses. He'd be hitting on, he'd be, right. as I said about him, he's the kind of guy who's the last guy to leave a party hitting on the, the, the wait staff, you know, putting away the dirty dishes. Would they have Roger Clinton? You never hear about Roger Clinton yeah. anymore. So anyway, I think, I think credit needs to go to uh, Melania especially and to Donald Trump for having his first state dinner come across without a hitch. I mean, there were no people jumping into the dinner as happened in Barack Obama's first state dinner and getting through security. Remember the, what were those people, the Salahis? Oh yeah, they snuck in, right? Yeah, and, uh, so anyway, if we go back into the slides. One last question. This is Macron's wife. He looks substantially younger than her. He is substantially younger than her. And, you know, to each his own whatever. Hmm. Yeah. People were unfairly saying about him that, uh, you know, he, he watched a lot of American TV and uh, he especially loved the show How I Married My Mother. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, anyway, <laughs> and on we go back to the slides. <laughs> yeah. So, poor Emmanuel. Uh, I think this this one here. Oh. He really it was. He must have had. I'm sorry. I'm used the phrase. He must have had like a major league brain fart, mm -hmm. thinking that he could go address Congress, uh, as he apparently did today, and suggest that Donald Trump should reject nationalism. It's like, dude, how many cognacs did you have last night? She should also suggest that Trump stop having sex with models. I think that'll go over just about as well. Well, I think he stopped that one. That, that's, well, that's at least one. He's got Melania. Right, exactly. But, uh, you know, it's very clear that there's actually a wave, a proper wave, of people saying, you know, we have all these nationalist bureaucracies that are too big and need to be smaller. Mm -hmm. The solution is not to create a very small and easily corrupted globalist absence of government. Mm -hmm. and just turn the keys to that over to a whole bunch of people who run badly small nations like Norway and small nations like Canada or whatever. That's not the idea that works here. I mean, you need to reform the gigantic bloated national bureaucracies in the United States across the individual states of Europe. Once you get that done, if they're projects of common interest, yeah, maybe we can have alliances. 
But a global governance system is not the best of ideas, even for the United States, the States, which has five times as many people, roughly, than France. But this was the idea that Herbert Walker Bush introduced in 1991 or 1992 at the UN when he flat out called for a new world order. Uh, <laughs> doesn't make any sense. We'll, we'll get into that in some considerable depth on another day. Okay. But um, so I heard a lot of chatter the last several days. We don't need to pull this one up about uh, how the blue wave was going to, you know, swamp the Arizona race in for special seat in Congress, uh, that didn't happen. Hmm. But on this one, I do want to pull it up. Here's Alan Dershowitz. I don't know what he's, you know, what they put in his, whatever he has for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Hmm. But he is here showing why it is that he became, I believe, the youngest ever Harvard Law professor. Uh, he's got a keen mind with an eye to how individual actions by powerful actors will create precedents that could be damaging to the rights, in particular, of minorities. And what is going on here, I think, what's playing out and why we started this saying it's bigger than, Obamagate's worse than Watergate. This is an abuse of the Constitution, which, you know, to go after Trump and the way they're going after Trump and to go after Americans and perceived opponents of the regime the way it happened under Obama, hmm. this is a set of abuses that will serve as precedents if they are not, if they do not stand corrected. Punish them immediately. For, for, for worse people. And here Dershowitz is saying, you know, actually, all this chatter about Bob Mueller is an exemplary person, and, and not so much. I mean, what was he doing with the Whitey Bulger thing? You know, and what abuses happened? And 9-11 and all this stuff. He is certainly not above reproach. And just forgetting all that, forgetting what Dershowitz says here, I mean, why did Bob Mueller, you know, why was he interested in being FBI director? Why, you know, what, what exactly did he do uh, from September 4th, 2001 to September 4th, 2013 as FBI director? There's a lot of questions to ask about this guy, Mueller, and why did he pack his team the way he did? Why did he accept the assignment? If he's such a great above the board, nonpartisan person, why yeah. did he say that there was a need for a special counsel who was not actually investigating a crime, which is what's called for under the special counsel statutes, as I understand it. You, special counsel can't be, you know. Searching for a crime. Right, and he, can, and he certainly can't just be set up to be, you know, just do whatever he wants over here. But that's what's happened, isn't that, it? That's what happened. <laughs> indeed. indeed. Yeah. So if it's we- the second longest tenure as FBI director in history after yeah. J. Edgar Hoover. And we don't, we don't need to pull up the Rod Rosenstein link but there it's just basically saying the rumors are he's out looking for a job. And I don't know if it's possible to work where he may end up. Let's, let's look at it though, okay. because this is important. And actually, I got a question from someone today. First of all, this photo of Rod Rosenstein, it almost looks like a, a cartoon or something that we would produce. <laughs> like, is that a real picture of him, not modified by some crazy Snapchat filter that makes his eyes and teeth gigantic? Whatever he was eating or drinking at the time, less of that. Less yeah, of that. It's like, whatever lens this is, don't shoot on that. <laughs> it's not good. <laughs> but someone wrote to me about, you know, Rod Rosenstein's wife was involved with the CDC or something like this? No, Rod Rosenstein's wife is a lawyer, I believe, the name will come to me, of Armenian descent, mm -hmm. um, who worked in the Clinton Justice Department. Mm -hmm. And... You know, a lot of times what happens is that in married couples, they, they may meet if they met in college or graduate school, and they may have one set of views, but then, the, you know, just the way it works, the, the wife has a few children and, you know, changes her mind about things and can become a lot more left-leaning. Uh, it could be that Rod Rosenstein, I don't believe, I think he's a registered Republican, I could have that wrong, but again, the, the rules about conflicts of interest do not go in as deeply as they need to um, into uh, the various and sundry relationships. There's a nice look on the right there. Mark Hamill. Luke Skywalker. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going to have to look into this some more because people were talking about his wife being somehow... Here. Yeah, Lisa Barsoomian. Somehow involved... The National with Institutes of Health, right? Right, and there's this doctor from the CDC who showed up dead, like drowned somehow. 
and we've heard about how the CDC, there was a whistleblower scientist who had sent a report about the Merck DPT vaccine causing statistically significant rise in brain injuries in African-American male children from 18 to 36 months, and the CDC buried this report. Yeah, well, don't forget the CDC is very much a, a factor, I believe, a donor to the Clinton Foundation uh, for the HIV AIDS related work. And also, it's important to remember that the, the purpose of the CDC is to promote vaccination. So they're sort of an advertising agency for the pharmaceutical companies. It's a little crazy. Right. So, so I, you know, of course, the mainstream press won't do the research. So to the crowd, you know, let's get smart on who this Barsoomian person is, what are, what are her family interests. Um, finally here, um, you brought this up uh, perceptively at the time, a number of presentations ago, this Syria question, and here we have the latest report on Zero Hedge, no evidence of capital weapons at Syrian facilities bombed by the U.S. Now, could it be that the Russians and Syrians have scooped in and gotten rid of whatever evidence may have been there? I it seems think, hard to do after it's bombed. I thought, yeah. I think not. So, um, again, for the reason that uh, until 2001, I'm trying to remember, who was President of the United States in 2001? Uh, wasn't it George W.? I believe so. So we've been at war now, various places, for 17 years. Entire okay? duration of Barack Obama's presidency, first president in history. Well, and, and some people, you know, as I, as I like to say about... Uh, uh, Opie Graham, bless his heart, you know. Uh, I mean, I was, I was in a liquor store the other day and I think this woman was just trying to be very nice to me or whatever and she carded me. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, right, yeah, I don't think so. You look 20. Get straight. Yeah, get some new glasses, okay? <laughs> but I mean, there are people who are 21 years old who probably don't remember a single day when we weren't at war because most of people course. can't remember back to four, four right? Oh, but and, they, and also they think that 9-11 is like this, they don't even, I don't know, it's weird. That's strange to me, people who are like, 9-11, huh? Yeah, yeah. It anyway, feels like last week in some regards. Yeah, it was a, ser a searing experience for those of us who lived through it. Yeah. So um, this thread I want to put up, someone sent this to me the, uh, the other morning, I think yesterday morning, and it's not to go through now, it's way, way too long. It, uh, I don't know who this Bustard Hyde, USMC, retired, but you did, did, thanks for your service, sir, and great work. But if we go down this thing, you'll see what I'm talking about. It's a long tweet storm. That's a great the, image <laughs> We could right use there. that one. I love the shadow. Yeah, that's the shadow well knows. I was jealous of that meme when I saw it. The shadow knows. But here he starts pumping out some of this. It's like 50 points long, mm -hmm. right? So maybe you can read it at your leisure. I'll read it at my leisure. But people really need to go into this examine it in the crowd, you know, tweet it around, let's get people, you know, following these points, getting it. A lot of the points we've covered, yeah. but some we haven't. And, and this has already been happening. People have been sending this to me, so this, it's good. People are finding these things. Good. So then we go back into the old slide of ruse. Um, all right. This is hilarious, the second one. This is a reason to go to the Strand and check out Amy Chozik's book, because we're not buying it. We're not making her richer than she already is. <laughs> but look at this. This is from her book. Hillary AIDS called the Clinton Foundation Chelsea's nest egg. Wow. Right? So they're joking about it. Well, it's not, you see, and it's not a joke. I mean, you saw Doug White's, and people who haven't watched, it's a long, three hours is a lot of time to ask to watch something, but look up Doug White. Look up his credentials, they're very impressive. Look at what, how, how rough people were on, you know, wrongly against the people at Wounded Warrior, the co-founders of Wounded Warriors. That's Look how they bad, treated them, yeah. you know, even though the thing was being pretty well run. And here we're joking. What was this one here, actually? Even under 16 had to pay to ask her questions, and a family photo with Hillary cost $10,000? Wow. I mean, it's like, I, I can't conceive of paying. I mean, you've got you to have won five lotteries. To you could go about. on a date with Lady Gaga for less than that. <laughs> <laughs> you could book Snooki. Yeah, right, exactly. Well, right? Snooki's, no, yeah, Snooki's getting more than Hillary Clinton, so you might have to pay 12000 for a photo with Snooki. Right. And they have a Jersey Shore movie coming out, so her really? rate is going oh, wow. through the ceiling. But I love this, that they, they open Vuv Clicquot Champagne an hour after the poll, polls closed. Wow. 
Oh, man. This only has, a, surprisingly, it only has 182 shares. It's amazing. Maybe, this is one I would read. Don't pay for the book. I mean, the smartest thing to do is maybe read it and return it, if you can do that. <laughs> <laughs> but definitely write a review. It's not, not financial advice. Oh, man. So um, we've had a comment in the past that ca caused me to go back and research it. I know Wikipedia may or may not be accurate, but remember, mm. we went through this issue you know, and we're talking here about Obamagate. The whole story here is Obamagate. We have a community of fraudsters who have been covering up the globalist corruption that goes back at least to 1998, 88 rather, probably includes Bush people, HW, certainly oh, includes yeah. Clinton people, definitely includes W people, obviously includes Obama people. I don't think it really includes too many Trump people, but who knows? We haven't really defined Obamagate on this episode. What is it exactly? Obamagate, Watergate was the subversion of the constitu Constitution for uh, political ends. This is the, su the subversion of the deep state for financial gain. I mean, this is, this is, and you know, the trammeling of the Constitution. And by deep state, you mean FBI, CIA? Security agencies, big donors, academia, corporate media, all the above. Hmm. You know, I felt, you know, we can let the plebeians, you know, go and do pretend that they're, you know, really doing something. They'll scatter to the winds. <laughs> Meanwhile, while they're busy going to and from work, care, taking care of kids, pretending the elections matter, we're just going to rig everything, steal this, pile a whole bunch of debt on the next generation, steal, you know, these crooked deals. We're going to pay the executives too much money, pay these other celebrities too much money. And by the time anyone figures it out, you know, we'll all be dead, so who cares? <laughs> you know, and that, that's, I think, far, far worse than whatever Tricky Dick actually may have done uh, in the 72 to 74 period. Well, far but they're worse. also doing whatever Nixon did times a thousand because they can do it electronically without actually having to break into the Watergate. Right, and, and they're, they're, on that, I just I was going to say something earlier. I'm, well, here I'm veering off. You know, there ought to be a metadata protection, and it's equivalent, metadata protection act. There ought to be... You know, people ought to be told what the true value of an individual's metadata might be, you know, across the spectrum, on a spectrum. How valuable is it? And individuals ought to have an absolute right to protect that metadata. And if they need to sell it or want to sell it, they can sell it for fair value. Hmm. The notion that you get a little toy over here, some Alexa robot, and you <laughs> give up something that's, you know, like 30, 35 cent piece of garbage, and you give it up for you know, a million dollars of value. Well, you're paying for that Alexa also and or, everything that you order through or, it. Or, or, or you, well, you know, you, give, you get a Facebook platform or a right. YouTube platform for free or whatever yeah, it costs yeah. in the case of YouTube, um, and you give up all this valuable information. There ought to be a requirement that you're told how much that stuff is actually worth hmm. before, because you're not making an educated trade. So we, we've gone through this whole thing about the insider who early in January, the State Department insider who we, we did it last show, um, and we've done it many shows, particularly December 24th with Biljana mm -hmm. um, over there in Sweden late at night, early in the morning on Christmas. Um, we still don't know who that was. We don't yet know who it was, but we do know that Andrew McCabe was, took the job of being, if you go down the right hand side of there, you'll see it's right there. February 1st, 2016 to January 29th, 2018, he was the deputy director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Yeah. Coming in February 1st, 2016. And that report of the on, on the incident did not get pr put into the files until around the 20th of February, whereas many other reports, transcripts oh. went right out. Wow. So it would seem to me that, again, and maybe the Horowitz report will cover it, maybe it won't, that you know, just like I believe James Comey was put in to make sure that the William investigation into the William J. Clinton Foundation didn't produce an indictment, you know, I think that McCabe was put in to the spot February 1st, by February 1st, 2016, to make sure that nothing materialized of this uh, investigation under 811C, the referral that started July 10th, 2015. That's why McCabe was put in there. And you know, we need to really understand. And we know the man can lie, right? So we don't really care what comes out of his flapping gums. He's been brazen. He's talking about suing Trump for defamation. Right. Gilbert, the Gilbert Gottfried What's Award. What's up with that? How can he be? I mean, <laughs> yeah. he's really facing serious prosecution, isn't right. he? Right. I mean, he needs to. I mean, this is a guy who actually knows where the, literally, where the bodies are yeah. buried on all the investigations. He is the guy who bought the lime. 
That's right. <laughs> and the coconut drank them both up. It's not the first hole he ever dug. <laughs> Which movie is that from? That's Goodfellas. Oh, that's right. Okay. <laughs> so then, you know, here, are the, here when we look at this, so that's February 1st, you know, you've got McCabe on top of the, uh, the FBI. Nobody's going to do anything with the Clinton Foundation investigation. McCabe's on top of that. Yep. Then you look at this, if we pull up the Democratic Party primaries and look at, we go down a little bit through the results, you know, I, I think it's past time for the people who gave money to Bernie Sanders to ask for the goddamn money back. Well, that's what Jared and Elizabeth were trying to do, and they told them to F.O. Or P.S., pound sand. Basically. <laughs> but, you know, you look at there's a whole bunch of primaries were going on. And, you know, a lot of them were close. I think he was robbed in New York. He may have been robbed in a whole bunch Nevada or whatever. Nevada, yeah. I think that's an East Coast pronunciation. I think it's Nevada. Nevada. Yeah. I'm told by my dad who's a Western. Oh, she won the popular vote. Oh, that's obvious that she won, <laughs> right? That just shows you how effed up the school system Why is. Why isn't she 50 points ahead? Exactly. You know, I mean, it's ridiculous. Mm. She won, well, whatever. So, uh, in terms of, uh, this is a great thing here. This uh, Katie Pavlich does fantastic work over Town Hall. Um, if we could pull that one up. Uh, that, yeah. Yep. Sorry, I was just responding to Joe Napoli's interest in the whole digging comment. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But here's, you know, here's Loretta Lynch. I mean, you know, it's, it's one thing to be, you know, inept at lying. She it's always a, has a little bit of a deer in the headlights look. Yeah, or, or kind of like, you know, fake, uh, you know, James Clapper. You know, he's sitting there and he's, he's asked a tough question and he's going, well, uh, I, 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 and he starts with his other hand patting the top of his head. It's like, dude, those are like tells. It's like you're, you're just like telling the umpire. It's like I'm lying. I'm lying. You know, I mean, what is it? What do they have over Loretta Lynch and her husband? I don't know. You know, they got something. Hmm. So, um, but we got to know. You know, not only what happened at the tarmac meeting, but why was the reaction to the tarmac meeting that the FBI was very concerned about how the people figured it out and who was leaking, right? It wasn't that we're really- that Something it, bad happened. It, it, it wasn't, like, oh, you found out. Yeah, James Comey didn't sit there and write a memo to himself about, well, I better do something about Loretta Lynch. No, it's like, hey, we got to figure out who these rotten apple Phoenix agents are who are not with the playbook. Right. You know? Because it was some journalist who discovered the meeting, right? I forget who. We should know. That's a very important maybe, piece of journalistic activity. Maybe we should try to reach out to that person. If Laura Loomer has contacts in Arizona, perhaps we can do that. Maybe. So in the next slide, um, Richard Pollack, you know, we, I, go, I was involved a little bit helping him with this, this story. But look at this, the date of this, July 26, 2016. Oh, sorry. Because you could. I think we need. This to says to continue without whitelisting. We can do that. Oh, can we? Yeah. There we go. Right. So here's a story that got 56,000 Facebook shares. It appeared at 10:21 at night. I don't know what day of the week the 26th of July was, but this is remember August 12, 2016. McCabe support, supposedly got a blistering phone call from who was it? Uh, Axelrod, Michael Axelrod. At justice saying, you know, you better stop this, this investigation crap. Here's, <laughs> you're the FBI. What are you doing investigating? Yeah. <laughs> what <laughs> is this? You're the Federal Bunglers Institute. You're not supposed to do this kind of stuff. I mean, this, this could screw everything up. We got a deal here. You know, we got, we got Hillary Clinton. She's going to be president. And we can blackmail the crap out of her. Axel Rudd wants to make it the Federal Bureau of not investigating. <laughs> right. Exactly. So, you know, here we have it. I love the picture that he selected. Um, but, you know, just for the record, the caption says Clinton Foundation, nonprofit foundation under Clause 501 of the U.S. Tax Code. Actually, the Clinton Global Initiative did, did, never was organized lawfully. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's not a thing. But anyway, <laughs> here's Richard Pollack, um, you know, saying, if you go down the page a little bit, he's talking about this July 15th letter by the brave and wonderful Marsha Blackburn, who charged, along with other Republicans, that the IRS, FBI, and FTC were lawless. They charged the foundation with being lawless, which they were and is, are rather. Um, it's a lawless pay-to-play enterprise. You know, Marsha Blackburn, I've actually had the privilege of meeting her uh, at least once, and her staff a fair, a fair bit. 
And these are, these are serious and smart people, and I hope Marsha Blackburn, big shout out to her, I hope she wins her Senate race uh, in November. She deserves to represent the great state of Tennessee in the Senate. Mm -hmm. But you go down this a little bit uh, further, and you'll see that um, Richard mentions the number of offices that uh, we keep going down a little bit further. Uh, it says, uh, keep going. Right. We've talked about this before. 28 countries. There's Justra, Uranium One. There's somebody you know. Uh, and then you keep going. It says, well, I guess it, maybe not in this one. I thought it's maybe the very first paragraph it says how many field offices. Uh, uh, whatever. Uh, Richard, um, Richard Bird Dog, the idea that there were four FBI field offices hard at work. And we've talked before about the great Cheryl Atkinson on yeah. page 242. She talks about this. Um, so um, that was a thing. There was a real live FBI investigation. And, you know, it stopped. So if we go back in, yeah. Federal Bureau of Indeed Investigating. Right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Fibby. And uh, we don't hit, need to hit this link. People have seen it before. Not enough people in the, in, you know, in the Congress, in the, dare I say, the lamestream press have looked at it. But there was an FBI investigation, 2001 and 2005. Hit that link and you'll find out about it. You don't have to, though. So, <laughs> Looks uh, good on you, though. All right. And you also <laughs> don't have to hit this is shameless self-promotion. We've shown people before. I, I, before July 26, I, I got very nervous about the FBI. I was not... Even before the tarmac meeting, I was not happy with what, what I was seeing, and I didn't want to, you know, give my cards completely on the table. So I thought to the FBI. So I thought, why not put it out there on my site? And Zero Hedge picked this up, and I think it has over 250,000 views. Um, but there, you want to figure out what the fraud is? Answer the question. Follow the leads that are out there in that paper, and you will see the fraud very clearly. And I, as I think people are. Um, now we have this thing about. The text messages. The text messages. Now, they just, I think, may have come out. Like, Last night. It was pretty, it seemed explosive. They were threatening Trump. and I didn't read them yet. So, I, But this is something that's, that summarizes them. I'm going to take my time. I was very busy today, not, not the least of which preparing for this. But I want to read them carefully. And I want to see all the damn effing emails. Right. I, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't buy this idea that there, there are no emails, you know, that nobody has them. I think a lot of people have the emails. These aren't the emails you're looking for, Charles. <laughs> I know. And I believe that Meadows, Mark Meadows and Ron DeSantis are both going to get them emails. See, I just, I feel like this is a message to someone about the emails. It's a very curious recurring number. Well, I, you know, you like the 33, but I, no, I, don't I think... I like the, it, I just notice it. Well, I think the real number of emails has to be a lot higher. For example, uh, the email chain involving the Gates Foundation, 100 plus donations to the Clinton Foundation going back to 2001. You know, there are a lot of emails there. Don't tell me that nobody around the Gates Foundation knows how to use emails, right? <laughs> they all got deleted. They yeah, had it on it, Windows. It's amazing. All the records of the Gates Foundation, you know, like, damn, Microsoft, I'm never using that again. Better but, back it up next time. <laughs> back up the truck. <laughs> but anyway, um, we need to get all the emails, and uh, here's one thing. I, I just want to punch this USA Today thing at the very bottom. Not that, yeah. And you know, here's a shout out and a warning to the Obama Foundation. You know, I had what I considered to be a very productive conversation with the folks at the Obama Foundation last year and then earlier this year, and I am very disappointed to see this story because I did check. Um, and the New York State Charity Bureau search this morning, just, uh, just before I came down here, the Obama Foundation has not amended its Articles of Incorporation, right. okay? And they should not. You told them to, didn't And you? I warned them to. And I told them, you know, you know, you don't have to listen to me. You know, I'm just a guy. I'm a member of the public. I may know a little bit about this area. People are, the odd person watches, watches this show. We need the crowd to contact the, um, Illinois Attorney General, which is a lost cause, but the Illinois governor, which may not be a lost cause, and say, look, this cannot stand. This is supposed to be, it's a, the, the paperwork of the Obama Foundation was not organized properly. But okay. don't guys like that want to be on Barack Obama's good side? 
I doubt it. No, in fact, it's the reverse in Chicago. It's, it's the irony of all ironies that you know, the people and the, the community organizers, the current <laughs> generation of community organizers, is up in arms. They don't want the Easter Island head you know, in, the, in the middle of their community. You know, they really don't. They, it's apparently a blight on the neighborhood. Wow. And they're going to mess up the no local park. And there's all these community organizers up in arms. Wow. And, and a lot of people you know, view Barack Obama as you know, a carpetbagger. You know, he went into Illinois, and then he went to Springfield, and then the second he could, he went to D.C., and he never went back to Illinois. Huh. So, you know, I, I, I hasten to add that I think that it is appropriate to have a, a truly balanced uh, examination of all these presidents. It cannot be, you know, that only supporters of Obama keep the papers of Obama, and only of H.W., H.W. and W. and Carter. And it's got, those papers are the property of we the people. Somebody who has nothing to do with politics should be sifting through all of them and making sure that you know, they're organized properly. But Barack Obama, whatever you may think of him, you know, I think that he waged a war on capitalism and it was a disaster for this country. But he is an historic figure whose life deserves to be studied and we need to learn it from you know, his life. I'm sure there are good elements to him. And to, I'm sure there are great elements to his family. Nothing coming to mind right now. <laughs> no, no, no. I think it's, I actually I'll say one. I mean, I think and I said, I've said this many times, I, I cannot imagine how tough it must be to raise two daughters, two young daughters. In the White House? In the White House. Yeah. Uh, you know, as the first African-American family, um, you know, living in that place, the pressures to, to, you know, keep those kids from becoming, you know, brat, brats to the, you know, whatever, the Google power, and just to keep the family together, it must have been intense. And yeah. you know, for what I can see, and all, I'm just like, you know, I've never come close to them and I don't want to, but it would appear to me as if they did a good job of that so far. Yeah. Of course, the older child has acted up, had to take a year off, whatever. That but happens. She smoked a little pot. It's not really yeah, the biggest uh, thing. That, that doesn't come down from yeah. father to daughter at all. <laughs> well, it's not the big, I mean, it's not even illegal in every state, but you never really hear anything. I can't even remember, oh, Sasha is the younger one, right? But they, they seem to be, per, you know, their kids are kids. I had the fortune of actually, you know, dropping out for five years to be a single father for my two children. And I can tell you, it, even with all the help that I had in terms of a nanny and friends or whatever, it is not easy. It takes a village, Charles. It, no, screw that. It takes, you know, engaged, you know, people who are, will speak to your children as if they, you know, not, not lecture down to them, try to understand what's going through their minds. It takes a lot of hard work that people who are, you know, couples where both people are working, you know, it's very, very difficult to work as hard as everyone does and then come home and be a good parent to two children, particularly at that age. And all the things I dislike about Barack Obama, he does appear to be a loving father, so. Yeah, yeah, and so it's just, I mean, he's just, completely wrong in economics and useless <laughs> on foreign policy. Other than that, he lies about everything. He's a great president. But yeah. no, I think the story of Barack Obama, just like the story of Melania Trump, you know, is, a, is an unusual path. Came from a foreign country. <laughs> no, I, didn't, I, wasn't making that point. I was not making that point. But he lived, he was raised in a foreign country. He was raised in Indonesia. Pakistan. And not, never Pakistan, but Indonesia, which is not so easy to do. I mean, think about his upbringing. He, you know, he never really knew his true father. And then he was taken into this stepfather's I thought he did. Boat. He spent a lot of summers with Frank Marshall Davis. I'm not going there. And then he, <laughs> try as you might, I'm not going there. But, but then, then he was in Indonesia with his stepfather, a, a very difficult time in the immigration. Mixed race family. Well, but beyond that, then the mother says, you know what, you know, you're 12 or whatever the age was. I think I'm going to just send you back to live with your grandparents and a wife because, you know, going from, through puberty is not something that's complicated for either a boy or a girl. I, I'm gonna send you to live with your grandparents who hardly know you in Hawaii to be the poorest kid at their rich school for spoiled brats. You know, I mean, that, that kind of a decision is, is gotta have had a, a major league impact. You know, it's a, one of rejection almost. That you, the mother says, you know what, get the hell out of here. I'm sending you to Hawaii, I can't deal with you. And uh, so for, to, to come from that and then go on this meteoric ride you know, where his grades were not so good, we don't really know what they were, but we know they weren't good enough to get directly into Columbia. Well, how, why do we not know what they were? He, could, uh, I don't know, because somebody doesn't want to, I mean, generally speaking, in my experience, if there's a contested issue and you have a strong bit of evidence, you don't say, you know what, rather than give you my report card, which will prove how well I did in high school, I'm not going to show it to you <laughs> <laughs> because it was that good. I don't want to 
hurt yeah. your feelings. You know, right. I mean, you you saw all these A pluses. You might, you know, you might have a, I don't know, whatever. You might be triggered by my great grades. Right. I don't think that's how it worked. Right. So he, he didn't do so well. You know, he's a member of the Chum Gang at Punahou School, however you pronounce it, Punahou or whatever, which is a great school actually. The Chum Gang. I never you heard, heard about Chum Gang? He talked I've about it. I never heard about it. Chum Gang. Chum, C H O O M. I don't know anything about that. Well, in Hawaii, they might have the odd bit of entrepreneurial pot out there underneath the palm trees and elsewhere, uh -huh. and so yeah, they would smoke a lot of pot and they call themselves the Chum. It's in his, it's in various books. Wow. But it's not surprising in that generation. I no. mean, you know, kids of that age, especially at these prep schools, the first thing they do, you know, you check in in ninth grade, where's the pot? <laughs> <laughs> Over here, who are the people who haven't been smoking pot yet? We got to get you right into them, you know? So that happens. We're getting some RF interference today, Charles. I'm not sure why that is. Uh, well, anyway, well, next slide. Yeah. So um, I think we can go to the next page, actually. Boom. Okay. So this is a very important slide. I want to give it justice. Um, today is the 40th anniversary of Juanita Roderick's rape by Bill Clinton. And wow. Newsweek has, and I don't really like Newsweek at all. I think it's a joke. Yeah, I agree. But, but uh, it used not to be a joke. But this is something people need to think about, particularly you Democratic senators who were, didn't look at the evidence of this that was in the evidence when Bill Clinton was up for impeachment. You need to think about this. Here we are, 40 years after the incident and 20 years after impeachment, uh, the, impeach, the vote to indict, rather, to impeach, almost 20 years after that. I think the Hillary Clinton and, and Chelsea Clinton especially, who want to hold themselves out as paragons of the feminist movement, you know, and what we got the Me Too movement bringing down people over allegations of improper behavior. And here you have uh, Juanita Broderick not giving up her search request for justice, which I, I had met Juanita Broderick several times, and also I want to have a shout out to Kathleen Willey and Paula yeah. Jones and Kathy Shelton, whom I've also met. You know, Hillary and Chelsea and others are virtue signaling, going around and claiming that they really believe in this Me Too movement when they're still, I mean, don't tell me that, you know, Al Capone's daughter would say, you know, he's my dad. <laughs> I can't really, I mean, I gotta, he's my dad. What do you want me to do? I mean, if you're out there, if Al Capone had a daughter, which I, I think don't think he'd... They, they might say that. I, I, don't, I don't know that that's the case. I mean, you get to a point, Jeffrey Dahmer's kids, if he had any. Does he, you know, have, he ate them. <laughs> right, you know what I'm saying? It, it comes to a point where you gotta say, especially if you're this proud, I mean, think of Chelsea Clinton. She's a proud daughter of a proud, in theory, feminist. Wouldn't you think that you go, you know, into your own room and say, you know, or you go to a, like the, the battery of shrinks that are paid for by the Clinton Foundation for her and, and say like, hey, you know, how can I be a feminist and not castrate my own dad? I mean, it's like, because it, he's still behaving like this, even now. I think when you're dealing with people, I mean, this is psychopathic behavior. Someone who would rape a woman and lie about it. Twice in half an hour you know, I mean, become the president and everything, obviously doesn't care and is super into lying people to cover it up and make it seem like he's a great guy. I think he's done that to Chelsea and whoever right. for her whole entire life. So she, it's her perception, you know, perception's everything, right? I mean, I, but again, I mean, here's Ch Chelsea Clinton. I've never met her. I don't want, again, I'm not interested in meeting people like that, but, but, you know, by all accounts, and maybe she just got her various degrees, got into Stanford, diarrhea and then on the brain. <laughs> but no, no. But by all accounts, she, she she did reasonably well in school, which you've got to believe she would be able to do, right? If you assume that Bill is her father and Chel and Hillary's her mother, not going to the other place. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> don't go there, <laughs> please. But uh, you know, she, she's smart enough to have gotten through these different schools. She's smart enough to, you know, pull her career together. And she's a modern woman, you know, raising a daughter. And, yeah. you know, you, 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 there comes a moment, it comes a fork in the road where you decide, listen, you know, I'm however old she is now, pushing 40, uh, I'm not gonna put up with this anymore. I'm not. I've got I to just think she's snowed. I think she's snowed. Like that, you know, look, she's educated, but, you know, so is that guy. I mean, you don't just snap your fingers and become a lawyer and accountant. He obviously has education, but he's still fooled by all the 
elaborate nonsense. Well, again, if you if you, if your uh, Toys R Us is closed, but Frosters R Us is still open for business, and if you're you know if you're a fraudster, <laughs> I was sad that Toys R Us closed. Yeah, I have huge too. Lego statues in there. That was one of my first with my 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 eldest one of my first kind of failures as a parent. You know, I I, I said I, he must have been like three or whatever, and. We had this weekend home, and we needed to fill it up with stuff. We were, you know, I was working on Wall Street. My ex-wife had worked on Wall Street. And we had plenty of money, and we were up in the Poughkeepsie area, actually, which mm -hmm. is a very poor town. And I say, no, we're not going. Just you know, we're not going into the store and just buying everything that we want. We're, I will let you have one toy, just one toy. Now look Fair me enough. in the eye, and one toy. You understand that? That's all we're going to get. Yes, Daddy. One toy. It's not going to be a big toy, just one toy. I go into that store, it's like, sword gun, machine gun, <laughs> I'm like filling up I'm like, wow. the whole thing. My, I was like a little kid. And it was, it, the whole thing cost me like 70 bucks or something. Wow. It was nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Well, on that note, the next slide. <laughs> yeah. So um, here we have this uh, review from somebody else, and it's going to, it should have no What's problem with your about? browser. It's Gateway Pundit does this. Oh. Okay, so they've, this te review that's a stroke and text pe page text ma messages is going to take some time here. Now I'm told, I forget who told me this, that Paige, obviously, her husband said, you know, that's not going to happen anymore. He so, left her? And where do you think Paige was living? Uh, I heard she was living at like Obama's house or... The McCabe's house. McCabe's house. How weird is that? Yeah, that's On weird. many levels. That's like having Valerie Jarrett live at your house, which is happening with the Obamas. I mean, not it's like, my what? house. It's not going to happen. No. Yeah. It's not just a lot doesn't of room make, here, Charles. It doesn't, it doesn't make a lot of sense. <laughs> yeah. This is a nice drawing where they got the X through the game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's and, like the BLM. Yeah. And it's just, this, is, this to me, when we think, we take a step back and take the animus out of it, you know, whether it's progressives going after Republicans or vice versa, you know, we can, I think we can concede that technology is super powerful and that people walking around with 35,000 people walking around, if all, all of them have guns, with guns and you're the FBI and you're the powers of the FBI, that's a lot of power. Yeah. To think that, you know, that it was run the way it seems to have been run under Obama, and we can go back to J. Edgar Hoover and ask ourselves, you know, how good a job did he do? Not so good. Right. Uh, it seems to me that oversight of the FBI is something that needs to be brought also into the 21st century. And we need to really see and, and dwell on and recreate this whole timeline of what these people were doing, what, were, what was in their minds, who else knew about this, who could have intercepted these te text messages. Are we sure we have all the text messages? You know, th this is the 13 Blackberry crowd. Might they have had burner phones and I other phones? I think they said that these were uh, Samsung Android devices. But what I'm saying is, is it possible? To, does that mean they can't be hacked? Definitely no. Yeah. We saw from the Vault 7 WikiLeaks stuff that there's a lot of tools for hacking these. So yeah, yeah, who knows how secure or not secure it is. It's a little surprising that people in the counter surveillance business are like texting each other, we're going to get our That's country right. back. It's That's like, right. hello, someone's going to see yeah. that. It's like, exactly. No, they're not. We got that covered. Yeah, I don't mm. know. <laughs> so not, not our finest moment. So the husband left, Paige. Yeah. What does he do? He was working for the government as well, wasn't he? I don't remember, actually. Yeah. But uh, so, you get know, this is a guest. And here, here we have, this is actually a sad story, this Waffle House thing. You know, apparently the, the, the guy who, you know, in the Waffle House story, there was a, a shootout in, in Tennessee, this guy is probably, looks like he's mentally ill. But mm. apparently before he shot up the Waffle House, he, he was arrested uh, you know, behaving strangely in, a, in an area he was not supposed to be in near the White House. And people then went to the FBI and said, please do something about it. And they're like, we don't do that. We're the federal, under Obama, we're the Federal Bureau of Bunglers or whatever it is, the Federal Bunglers Institute. <laughs> and they decided not to do anything. Now, I appreciate that, that the issues of mental health are very vexing issues. There are certain types of mental health, bipolar and others. Yeah. People who have it are extremely smart. The laws right. in this country are difficult to institutionalize people, and even if you do, to keep them in there for treatment, you cannot 
rehabilitate yourself unless you decide you want to. After all, you can't like go to, yet, maybe with a mind phone hack you can do it, but you can't go into somebody's head and just like switch a few things. Right. And it's, it's, all, it's not even fully understood. Yeah. So it's, it's not an easy issue, and I'm not making light of it, but we need to get to the bottom of all these rotten apples in the FBI and the other agencies, and there needs to be extreme vetting at the yeah. FBI of the decisions. Well, Michael McMahon said that was a particular problem, was the vetting, and that that came from the top. And when he, as a rank-and-file agent, tried to bring attention to this, they shoved him out and ruined his life. We've now spoken to several former FBI agents who had been pushed out by the top brass when they tried to do the right thing. So it, it's important that we make it clear to everyone, including the FBI, who is hopefully listening, that we do respect and appreciate the FBI and want to get out the Andrew right. McCabe's, the James Comey's, et cetera, so it get, can get back to the proud organization that Robin Gritz describes to me that she felt it was. Well, or put it slightly differently, and I'm going to put words in your mouth. We both want, and you would crowdsource the truth and me as just a, your obedient servant, we want to make the FBI great again. Absolutely. And I want the FBI to help me make other people not have not so such great. a great time. Yeah. yeah. And so far they're doing good, so I don't want to upset them. So we have here this uh, thing uh, about Scandinavia and Judicial Watch, and bless Judicial Watch, Tom Fitton and uh, Michael Morris and Chris Farrell and those people are doing great work. They have, apparently the U.S. is now funding a Scandinavian, in quotes, humanitarian group that's helping Islamic terrorists. Now we had Why the great Biljana uh, Martinovsky was on December 24th. We ruined her Christmas Eve and her early Christmas morning. But it was a real treat to have her on. We should try to, get, so nice. try to get her back on if she could come back on. But the situation in Sweden is in past crisis mode. Yeah. And that great country needs the attention of Donald Trump and his mega megaphone. Mm -hmm. uh, because what's going on there is a descent into you know, worse abuses than occurred under Un Angela Merkel's you know, uh, early days when she lived in East Germany. I mean, it's, it's just it's going where when I was younger, Sweden was, you know, the, the, the uh, out, far out there open society trying anything that you could try. Now it's a society of conformists, intolerant, um, you know, going after anybody who might be critical of the obvious flaws of these, you know, this unbridled uh, inflow of immigrants who are creating their satellite uh, sanctuary communities where they're going out raping and abusing it's Swedish terrible. people and visit visitors. And if you complain about it now, you get fired. You know, yeah. or you get to, that's that's absurd. And the Swedes need to be called to task, rejoin the community of nations. These globalists who think you're going to get away with it, it's not a winning strategy. There shouldn't be a civil war in Sweden. You can't go from being you know an open society to now being worse than East Germany at its worst. Um, and it needs to be called out. You want to call out North Korea? Let's call out Sweden. Yeah. The I, axis of evil. I mean, we've got now friends who are giving us firsthand first-hand accounts of what's going on there. It's uh, a different type of uh, really unprecedented oppression of women who are fearful for their lives. And Biliana told us about women who killed themselves after being gang raped. And I mean, it's yeah, just it's like nuts. unheard of evil and they're right. suppressing it rather than prosecuting it. It is nuts. And I mean, here you have, you know, you got Saudi Arabia, which is, you know, going, is, is probably already more tolerant than Sweden, <laughs> you know, that's, shouldn't you be sitting up there, I mean, maybe stop drinking the Aquavit, you know, and, <laughs> and doing all the, going on the saunas and whatever you used to do, maybe, you know, go smell the coffee. Say, so, you know, like the people in Saudi Arabia are saying, you know, this radical Islamic stuff, but not so much, we don't want that anymore, in fact, we're gonna stamp it out, so you can let all the radical Islamists Move go to, to Sweden. Sweden. <laughs> Like it's that makes good. sense? It's I mean, not good. I mean, I think, I think Donald Trump really needs to make an issue of well, it. Well, he has, you know. He said, look at what happened in Sweden. And right away, the, the CNN dopes and everybody were like, You're oh, repeating yourself. What is that? Yeah. <laughs> Redundant. But they were bashing Trump for even talking about Sweden. And he was correct. Yeah. And, you know, dictators around the world with what's going on, we'll see, the Korean thing, North Korean thing may not end well. You know, it's a long way from here to an actual verifiable change in attitude. Well, they did announce that they were closing nuclear testing sites, didn't they? And earlier today they announced the reason they closed them is apparently one of them blew up. 
<laughs> I did not see How that, that may have happened, we don't know. Oh my God. But here we have Daniel Ortega down in you know, Central America, for some reason, I've only been to Costa Rica a few times. I've never dared go to Nicaragua or Honduras with their very high murder rates. I know somebody you could charter a helicopter with in Nicaragua. I, I went to business school with Carolina Somoza, who was, uh, you know, People I'm joking. That, I don't recommend you fly with this guy. Yeah, I wouldn't go there. That's not something I'd do. Uh, but anyway, Monica Showalter has been on, was on my radio show. She does great work. She's a specialist in Central and South American affairs. And uh, it looks like uh, old Daniel Ortega could be, uh, you know, if he doesn't watch it here, he may end up like the, the brutal ruler of, of Romania, who uh, mm. kind of had a rough uh, senior exit. They he was ripped to shreds by a crowd along yeah. with his wife. They misspelled. What? Shifoli. <laughs> That's right, Shifoli. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> but I think around the world, dictators have got to be saying, you know what, uh, this could not be so good for us here. Hmm. Um, now, in terms of business stuff, this Zero Hedge story is worth noting. Interest rates are really going up suddenly. And they're a lot higher in the U.S. This is the five-year paper. Uh, you know, it's the highest yield for five-year paper since September 2008. What that does just, that mean to people who aren't in the financial world? So basically, the, the fundamental ask, question to ask in investing is compared to what? You know, somebody says, I got this great idea, compared to what? So what you compare it to is treasury. Risk-free if you're a U.S. investor. You, you know, you, could, you don't have to worry in theory about the U.S. government going bankrupt, although maybe you should. <laughs> uh, but let's just assume you don't for the sake of argument. Right. right. So what does the U.S. government pay you by way of interest? In theory, you're going to get your principal back. You have to worry about inflation. You don't have to pay state and local income taxes on the interest. So that's, without making a tough decision, you can say, yeah, put my money in five-year paper or two-year paper or 10 or 30. So, when you see the benchmark interest rates suddenly go up and there's a shape of the interest rate cur curve, the longer you keep your money locked into a security, the higher the rate should ordinarily be. When you see that changing and maybe even going to this and having the short-term paper be more expensive than you know, the five-year, that when it goes up like that, that's called inversion and that's a sign of a currency crisis. In a currency crisis, you know, Finland, for example, in the currency crisis of whatever year it was, 99, I think, mm -hmm. or 8, mm -hmm. the, the uh, interest rate was 100%, wow. short-term interest rate, because you're in a mo moment where you, you, you don't have any foreign exchange. And so, uh, and you've got debts for, uh, in foreign exchange denominated that you've got to pay off. Right. So you've got to pay whatever it takes in the short run to get that foreign exchange, and suddenly your, your short interest rate goes way, way up. This is a sign that that may be happening. It's called the term structure of interest rates. When it departs off this norm like this yeah. to this, you got major league trouble. And well, what's that going to mean to the average person who maybe isn't an investor? Well, you know, I've been saying for a long time, in fact, on Utrecht's show the first time, I said, you know, it, it's, it's thought, uh, last year, I said like September, October time frame, it seemed to me as if Trump was winning and Trump was here to stay. And the one trick beyond the Russian collusion and maybe instigating an attack would be if the economy melted down. Because Donald Trump, in a way, if I, Mr. Tr President, if you're listening, if your people are listening, I wouldn't necessarily be touting the stock market as an indication of how well you're doing. You're making a lot of good changes, but we could have a situation where there's a crisis, currency crisis, and if interest rates continue to rise and invert because there is a crisis of confidence, perhaps provoked by speculators like George Soros, who could look at this and, you know, he definitely has Donald Trump's worst interest in his mind first thing in the morning and the last thing before he goes and to he sleep. And he loves to mess with currencies. He's broken right. multiple countries, including the UK, famously, where he made a billion pounds or a billion dollars betting against in just such a moment. So if you have the wherewithal and you're running with a crowd that has the wherewithal around the world to, to put on a big anti-Trump, anti-US economy bet, you can make a boatload of money tanking the US economy, which is really arguably what George Soros did and others have done across the emerging world. So um, this is a sign to me that, you know, people ought to be tread very carefully. Don't make, you know, don't think that the prices that are for all these uh, stocks are always going to stay elevated beyond sanity. Mm -hmm. they could, things could turn around very quickly. Hmm. And if we continue to the next slide, 
Um, so it's interesting. I, I have raised an issue, if we hit this finance, Yahoo Finance thing, um, I have raised an issue here um, that um, Jeff Immelt's pay and the idea, uh, you know, Jeff Immelt followed uh, Jack Welch into GE when the stock price was roughly 40 when Immelt took over uh, in September 7th, 2001, when now it's roughly less than 15. Jeff walks out with hundreds of millions of dollars of compensation in stock and lots of cash compensation and benefits and a huge pension. You know, I don't think that's right. I don't think that you, I mean, I, I think you, we need to rebalance uh, the risks and rewards for executives at these cushy companies. It's not like Jeff Immelt goes into, into work in the morning and it says, hey, I've got nobody to help me. You know, he's got like staffs of staffs of consultants, external consultants and internal consultants and all these flunkies working for him. And he didn't put any positive points on the board. It was a, just a complete wreck hmm. by the time he left. And he gets to walk out with a tremendous amount of money for doing that. That just sends the wrong message. And, it, and it, we have this, just as you talk about the corporate media being corrupted, we have this corrupt system where directors and executives conspire to, you know, you pay these people who really don't need the 500,000 a year to, for like 12 board meetings. And let's say they spend 30 days a year on the company or even 50. That's 500 grand. 500 grand of what you know about. Then there's, you know, the, you're hobnobbing at the board meeting. You're learning, meeting other big people and gaining advantages. Maybe because you're a director of GE, you're able to get preferred investment opportunities or your, your star rises and you get other benefits. Um, you know, the directors of a company need to have real liability. They cannot be insulated, in my view. Well, and oversight as well, because what we're not talking about, and this crosses over into Jan Weinberger's, uh, or Jan Weinberg's research, that a lot of people, I thought GE was making light bulbs until I started talking to you guys, but they're a gigantic military contractor, and they're having emails with the State Department and the Clinton Foundation, and they're, they're, right. this guy's like smack in the middle of the pay-to-play deal. Right, and you know, it, it, it's not enough, I mean, it's one thing to say, you know, I tried really hard and it was difficult, and, this, and that's the kind of stuff that you, you didn't like Woody Allen to be, your, <laughs> you know, the CEO of GE. I mean, El Presidente is down. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, yeah, exactly. I mean, you gotta perform, and in, in just the same way, I mean, people, these corporate people are fond of saying, you know, it's all about long-term strategy and value, and, <laughs> and then they go to the investment managers like, what do we do this week? <laughs> you know, how come you're making all this extra money on your carry? I mean, there has to be an alignment of interests. Uh, ordinary people understand that, you know, if you're just going to be a, a, a factory worker at GE, bust your ass. You know, you don't make $20 million a year at the end of it, right? And there are a lot of people depending on these uh, big Titan CEOs. There are, it's not simply all about GE. There are many, many investors. I think GE may be the most widely owned, at one point, the most widely owned stock by individual investors and certainly by all the investment funds, pension funds, not simply of you know, for-profit corporations, but teachers unions and governments and whatever, they all own GE. And there ought to be a rebalancing of this. And I think there should be a clawback, if it's possible, for you know, what really has happened to GE. And you know, we need to understand how far back the malfeasance, if any, may have occurred. Does it go back to Welch? Does it go back further beyond? And there well, needs to be a message sent to corporate America that no, under Donald Trump, you know, there's bipartisan, progressive, and I'm a conservative economic conservative saying, I will agree with progressives that I actually think workers should have pensions and that the pensions should be fully funded. And you know, people should be encouraged. It should be in the interest. If you think clearly as an American company, you need customers. You don't have customers by cutting the workforce down to a bone. You know, yeah. if you could pay Jeff Immelt 20 million, you know, you might want, and his whole coterie of whatever his people are, you know, all his hangers on and his assistant corporate jet pilot and the mechanic and his chauffeur and all these people, you can afford to figure out a way to, to raise the level of compensation for the workers who are actually making the goods, providing the services, give them a real pension, send a message, and then have that pension be managed responsibly, not in GE stock, other than in GE stock. There should be some real discipline. And, and pension funds need to stand up and, you know, turf these people out and go after them. 
And if the directors are not doing the job and the professional people are not doing their job, a message needs to be sent to them too. And I can tell you, GE is, is a poster child for an abuse, in my mind, long-running abuse of the capitalist system. So if I'm going to dump on Barack Obama, here's another reason I'll dump on him. Why <laughs> would you pick, out of all the people in this bar, you know, why do you pick Jeff Immelt to, to administer the stimulus program? What about the business, uh, what's round, that? Round table? But yeah. Again, I'm not, I'm not down with that. I'm not down with these clubs, you know, where right. you get together and it, all the biggest big wigs conspiring to screw everybody else. Well, again, you know, in, in my experience, uh, and there's a little bit of bias here going way back, you know, we had family companies. Those are the best kind of companies because you know, it, it can be all kinds of problems, the family companies. You, you shouldn't necessarily just because you know, the kid is the eldest kid, you don't pluck that person in who says, oh, I really want to be an artist. You don't say, okay, you're gonna run this gigantic Coke, Coke, I'm not saying it happened with Coke Brothers, but you know, a company yeah. like Coke Brothers just because they're the eldest kid or a kid. So there are all kinds of problems with family controlled companies, but on the other hand, family controlled companies that keep it together for generations do tend to do things correctly. They learn from their mistakes, there is a balancing. They understand it's tough to find talent and nurture talent and keep talent motivated and productive. Well, and they have a sense of family pride and they trust each other and everything. Right, but when you when you have a company, and I would argue in the case of GE, it was like, you know, we don't care. We'll try, well, that didn't work, let's try this. You know, <laughs> we were a healthcare company, now we're an energy company. We're a diversified company, now we're a finance company. It's just, you know, let's bring in the consultants, get on the jet, fly around the world, boom, 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 boom. They boom. don't even make light bulbs and, and they refrigerators do make, they, anymore. They do make light bulbs. Oh, I thought they sold that division to a Chinese company. They couldn't sell it. Wow. It's that bad. <laughs> anyway, so here, um, there is an, another area, you know, charity fraud and, and fairness and equity in executive compensation are two areas where progressives and conservatives will certainly agree when they think about it. Now, Bill Crystal, which brings us to the subject of Bill Crystal. Bill Crystal, uh, we like to end these presentations and we are almost done. You know, would you please just do the honorable thing and join the Democratic Party? Because you're, you're a bonehead. You know, he's just a bonehead. He's, he, he got everything wrong for the uh, last several election cycles. I don't know why this, oh, there's a video popping up. But it seems like it's not. Yeah. Whatever. Maybe I gave you a bad link. But he's, Bill Crystal saying that the Democrats are going to sw sweep the midterms, okay? Because uh -huh. he's mostly wrong. He's a valuable guy. You find somebody who's mostly always wrong, that's valuable. Right. Just do the opposite. Right. It's just extremely valuable. <laughs> I don't know, that video is not playing for some reason. Right, well, anyway, we'll go to the next one. it's a bad link, sorry for that. And finally, um, this is a topic that once we get the Clinton Foundation regulated, our next project, you're here, here, you will hear it now first on Crowdsource the Truth. My next target is going to be the Ivy League. Hmm. Uh, because I think what we have here is we have a bunch of fat, dumb, and happy people who are living large, breaking all the rules, have a gigantic endowment. They are case studies in what is called enormous, you know, mm -hmm. the illegal appropriation of private gain for the benefit of the professors, significant donors to the schools, et cetera. And then they the can I join Antifa and hit people in the head with bite locks. Right, and so the, the whole, the, this whole education mafia, which is a very large mafia, it's not simply the elite universities, it's the institutes, it's to a certain extent the, the, you know, the bought and paid for um, members of the media uh, who all you know, scratch each other's backs. Um, America's educational institutions used to be first rate, I mean truly first rate. And remember, my father explained this to me, I didn't know this, that, that in, for many decades, if not centuries, the leading universities in the world and from like 1700 to early 1900 were where? London. Germany. Oh. All right. What can happen when universities start producing closed minded, intolerant people? I mean, I think if we look at the period, you know, 1916 to wow. whatever it was, to right the way to 1945, wow. you know, intolerance, the decision that a bunch of people with, you know, fancy caps and credentials know better than we, the, the rest of people, and, you know, that there's one answer, one answer fits all, and if you want to you want to disagree, then you're an idiot, or you should be handed up. That is a very dangerous way to live, and I think history teaches us that that's the wrong way to live. 
And you know, people, generations are scarred for quite some time often by that type of behavior. And I think we should see what we see in this intolerance as a warning sign. Not that, you know, that Donald Trump's people, the deplorables are wrong, but indeed it's the elitists who are wrong. And you know, if, the, if, if, if we were in a great place geopolitically, if America's star had risen, you know, if we weren't hounded by 21 trillion of debt that we know about, all, by following the wisdom of the small crowd of elitists, then you know, maybe I'd be saying, you know, I'm not gonna complain too much about it. But once we get the Clinton Foundation and its network of donors regulated, which I believe is in process. And imminent I, almost. Very imminent. And you know, I'm not gonna betray confidences, but I would say that um, those who are gonna bet against the idea that the federal government in the United States and state governments and foreign governments are gonna do something about this, you know, it's bad, they, were, they, were, they were getting ready, they're putting their glass of champagne out. Hey, Chelsea, can I have some of that food could come? Because I, I really wanna be with you. Can I, I'd like to move down to DC. Can I be on the team? 10,000 for a photo, Charles. Yeah, I've not paid 10,000 for <laughs> cash, a photo. Cash, cash. You can't use no Bitcoin on that. Right. Well, Bitcoin's been pretty volatile the past uh, couple days, Charles. It was up, it was down, it's really. While you look at that, I'm just gonna let the record show that I finished in exactly two hours. So two, this is now all on you. Okay, no, no, no I'm, just, I'm kidding. We're just, gonna, we're just gonna wrap it up there and say that. No, 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 uh, I, but I, I wanna do one more thing. I'm just teasing. Sure. So we, keep going, Bitcoin, well, I'm just wondering. No, it's, uh, it's below 9,000, it was close to 10,000. It's all these cryptocurrencies are all over the place. It's a very difficult market to understand. Bitcoin's at about, $8,865 right now. I know you think it's virtually worthless. It's we'll not, see where it goes. It's not that, but I, if we just go back to the slides for a quick second, yeah. I want to explain what the balance of the presentation oh, is. Oh, right. It is, I, I, I went back and I thought it important, both for you, Jason, but for the crowd at large, to take a peek at some of the ways in which I reached out. Now this leads out, I, uh, this starts the 17th of April, 2016, okay? This just encompasses the hot period where it, be it became obvious that Donald Trump might be the nominee and it became obvious that Hillary Clinton might be the nominee. So what did I try to do in this time period? This leads, leaves out many, many appearances. Oftentimes when I would go on certain TV or radio stations, there was no special clip created. And to be fair to the mainstream press, I was extensively on CBS and ABC and NBC radio across the country in all sorts of markets. Uh, I was never on CBS, ABC or Maniac NBC television, but I was on, on Fox Business and I was on quite a few international television things. And none of those, many of those clips are not here. And rather than take up too much time with it, I just called anything, whether it was a blog posting or, you know, I call that print. Um, after, I guess, some I, call, some I call postings. Those were my own site, I think. But basically what we've got is a summary list of all of your appearances. Not all, not all. This many is just, a, not even many. It's probably a, th a third. It's probably a third. Wow. Uh, and there's 60 here in wow. this time, time frame. Now, some of them are interesting. Some are, there's one movie, uh, which I didn't put up. This, this is actually worth clicking on. It's pretty funny. The Guardian had a review of this as like the worst piece of crap ever done or something like that. The <laughs> yeah, they obviously haven't reviewed some of the films that I've worked on. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why this is taking time, but um, still, and I don't even know what Rotten Tomatoes is. That's a reviewing site. And it's pretty funny how this one, the one I had, had uh, when it popped up, it showed an ad for Heinz ketchup on it. But <laughs> well, it goes but, with the but tomato theme. I didn't know this, but the producer of this uh, this movie was apparently, according to this, the uh, he was the f producer of the second highest grossing political documentary movie of all time. Which was what? I don't know, but a guy's name is Bill Baber, and I had a small. It's got to be primary colors, no? Could have been actually. I don't know, but this was Daniel Halper's book, and I had a small part in this, mm -hmm. um, and there was an article in uh, Daily Mail about how it was gonna go national, you know, the, I think it came out right around this time, September 30th, that it's gonna go for a small run, and then it's gonna go all, whatever it was, 3,000 screens, or whatever the number of screens is, mm. and that didn't happen. Wow, 3,000 screens is a wide release, that's hard to get. 
Charles, your film did better than Maze Runner. So that's good. What's Maze Runner? I don't know, but it only got 42%. <laughs> so that's Rotten did, did, Tomato going splat. This is, you know, yeah. popcorn, not quite also, a Rotten Tomato. It also went to better than Den of Thieves. Yeah, not not, not so good as Paddington 2. How can you get 100% rating? Obviously, something? Hillary Clinton Yeah, that's right. That. And Jeff Bezos. <laughs> put that, and, the, and the team that gives you the negative strikes <laughs> also knows how to do all positives. Yeah, that's right. So this was my movie debut. Pretty good. Face Plant. Um, but yeah. people now will have a, a, a list when we upload this. Yeah, and we're going to update this. But this, this one is also, we put this up before. This is, you know, honestly, this was a, I, I really appreciate it. Ginny Thomas, you know, I didn't know who she was. I think I've told you this story before. And this was something I, that went up, uh, I believe it was, it's a half an hour, so you don't want to do that. But. No, we'll just let it roll. But um, this was Ginny Thomas is Clarence Thomas's wife. Oh wow! And I didn't know that when I, first, you know, when I accepted, I didn't even ask her who she was. <laughs> it was just a daily caller. She liked where he'd be in Washington, and we like Thomas is a very common last name. Yeah, exactly. But so she, she's a very experienced person, and uh, she asked me a bunch of questions. The the camera person was a graduate of Hillsdale College, and this is actually the Hillsdale campus hmm. in Washington D.C. And Hillsdale is an interesting school. It's got its pros and cons, but. But uh, this was a real honor to do this, and mm -hmm. I actually think it may have swayed a few votes. I mean, it mm -hmm. was, uh, she, and I didn't have any of the questions, I never get, I don't want questions in advance, but I didn't have them in advance, and she just asked them, and she did a little editing. Um, and this was right at the time of the Podesta email leak. This is, a, yeah, after it, but it was, it was several days before the election. This ran the whole weekend of the election, huh. before the election. Wow. And that's why I think it got so many shares and Great. whatever. So. Oh yeah, look at that. Quite a lot. So anyway, there's, there's a lot more out there. We're going to try to curate not only uh, this stuff, but first we're going to try to curate the many shows that Jason, you and I have done together. And we're going to put them out in a format. We're not going to do all of them because there's too many. But we're going to select some that people really need to go back and look at. And those particular that will help the prosecutors. Particularly, there are some new countries that I'm aware of that weren't all that interested until recently, and now that appear to be quite interested. And mm -hmm. we want to point those new countries and maybe some of the new state attorney generals into the meat of the issue. And there, so what we tried to serve is this gigantic smorgasbord of you know, all the different dishes that you this might want. This is like the charcuterie of financial <laughs> crime. <laughs> there we go. Oh, <laughs> we're going, where do we go next? Uh, I'm certainly not having any kombucha. There's no kombucha <laughs> served at this I don't know what you have against kombucha. I just don't like the sound of it. It's like yogurt. Ugh. Well, so Charles, we'll be back on Sunday with more uh, amazing information. And until then, is there anything else you'd like to leave us with? Well, I don't know if you want to talk about the crowd at all. But well, uh, the crowd is growing, you know, despite the strikes on YouTube. We've got nearly 6,000 uh, subscribers now on Crowdsource The Truth 2. And if people are watching us on Facebook or periscope.tv slash CS The Truth, or if you're in Russia watching us on vk.com, Previet, Cogdela, people can find us still on YouTube, Crowdsource the Truth 2. And of course, we've recently implemented the new live streaming feature on Patreon, where the live streams are now fed by Vimeo. And uh, it's the same material that people can get for free. But when you become a monthly sponsor by going to patreon.com slash crowdsource the truth, you gain exclusive access to those live streams. And you can avoid the inconvenience that people are having when these malicious anonymous strikes from unknown individuals with completely benevolent purpose, uh, they can avoid the inconvenience of losing access to the streams and they can always find them at patreon.com. And if you just want to support the show, if you like the type of work that we're doing, uh, that we're doing at Crowdsource the Truth, bringing you great investigations and research from people like Charles Ortel, people like Harmon Wilfred, people like uh, Phil Jan McConnell. Weinberg. Jan Weinberg is back. He was on vacation for a little while. I really try to get all of the most interesting guests that I can and varied points of view. Even when people disagree, I try to give them a fair shake. They still get mad at me. 
we'll see where it goes. People can also make a one-time sponsorship payment at paypal.me slash crowdsource the truth. And it is now becoming more important than ever that people who like the program sponsor it because as the resistance increases, I have to do more work just running to stay in place. One thing I forgot to mention I'd like to bring up quickly. Um, I was told by somebody I, I respect that uh, the new tax law actually places a limit on charitable contributions. That is not true. It, it, that is a massive loophole. So the question of uh, looking carefully at charities is going to be especially important going forward and one that the Trump administration is, and Congress is going to want to focus on very, very carefully. So the idea that you could find a crooked charity and uh, you know, I can't think of any, yeah. <laughs> begin with C, um, or B actually, um, <laughs> Bill, Hillary, right. but uh, you find a crooked charity and you say, all right, look, we know nobody's ever going to check, so we'll give you, how much money do you want in your Swiss bank account, and right. I want a piece of paper that says, I gave you a million dollars, right. and then I'll put that into the IRS and I'll get whatever the money is that I get back. So the question of charity fraud, I think, is going to rise in importance uh, in the minds of the Trump administration and the minds of the, chair, uh, the, the wider circle in America and around the world, in part because of the change in the tax code. And so that's why I feel very good about all the work that we've done and the work that Doug White does yeah. and the very few people who actually spend the time to get into the weeds. I think that work will pay off and bear fruit and do good things to protect donors, to protect American taxpayers and other taxpayers. So I feel very grateful to you, Jason, that you've invested all this time and the resources to let us have this great platform, and I hope it really flourishes. Thank you, Charles. And I just want to clarify that you're, you're talking about charities. Right. Money that people are using to sponsor Crowdsource the Truth is not a charitable contribution. Crowdsource the Truth is a for-profit business, and that doesn't mean that we're not striving to give you honest and true information. It just means that any money given to Crowdsource the Truth is a sponsorship payment, not a donation. And of course, you know, people like to criticize me for trying to earn money by what I do, but I spend all day meeting with people, you speaking put up with, with you, me. preparing these presentations. It's a pleasure to work with you, but obviously it takes time. Your, your work is, I haven't had the good fortune of being a, a Wall Street tycoon and uh, my, with my Hollywood career behind me, the savings are dwindling and it's more important than ever that people sponsor Crowdsource the Truth. And please go on to patreon.com slash crowdsource the truth and do that. Only a couple days left here in April, so now's a great time to do it. Also, people can purchase wonderful Crowdsource the Truth swag from uh, uh, redbubble.com. And if you want to get in on time phone hacking, which is a fun, uh, meme that Quinn Michaels has created and it's an interesting way to see how people interact with artificial intelligence and he's got AI bots tracking time phone hack the hashtag on Twitter and elsewhere he's also exploding the brains of idiots around the internet who are super upset about time phone hacking I don't fully understand that but uh, it's pretty funny I think Charles, I want to thank you again for an amazing program. I want to thank everyone for watching. Oh, there is one more thing. Periscope, I didn't realize this, but when people put hearts on Periscope, that is somehow monetizing the Periscope channel. So apparently we're about 12,000 hearts away from becoming a super broadcaster on Periscope. So if you're on Periscope and if you know what a super broadcaster is and Let you us want know. us to be that, <laughs> yeah, keep, keep sending the hearts. Thanks for that. Thanks, everyone, for watching. I'll be back tomorrow. Charles will return on Sunday at 3, and we'll see you then.